This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Buccaneers and Pirates of Our Coasts by Frank Richard Stockton. Chapter 21 Exit Buccaneer, Enter Pirate. The buccaneers of the West Indies and South America had grown to be a most formidable body of reckless freebooters, from merely capturing Spanish ships laden with the treasures taken from the natives of the New World. They had grown strong enough to attack Spanish towns and cities. But when they became soldiers and marched in little armies, the patience of the civilized world began to weaken. Panama, for instance, was an important Spanish city. England was at peace with Spain. Therefore, when a military force composed mainly of Englishmen, and led by a British subject, captured and sacked the said Spanish city, England was placed in an awkward position. If she did not interfere with her buccaneers, she would have a quarrel to settle with Spain. Therefore it was that a new governor was sent to Jamaica with strict orders to use every power he possessed to put down the buccaneers and to break up their organization and it was to this end that he set a thief to catch thieves, and empowered the ex-pirate Morgan to execute his former comrades. But methods of conciliation, as well as threats of punishment, were used to induce the buccaneers to give up their illegal calling, and liberal offers were made to them to settle in Jamaica and become law-abiding citizens. They were promised grants of land and assistance of various kinds in order to induce them to take up the legitimate callings of planters and traders. But these offers were not at all tempting to the brethren of the coast. From pirates rampant to pirates couchant was too great a change, and some of them, who found it impossible to embark on piratical cruises, on account of the increasing difficulties of fitting out vessels, returned to their original avocations of cattle butchering and beef drying and some it is said chose rather to live among the wild indians and share their independent lives than to bind themselves to any form of honest industry the french had also been very active in suppressing the operations of their buccaneers and now the brethren of the coast considered as an organization for preying upon the commerce and settlers of spain might be said to have ceased to exist but it must not be supposed that because buccaneering had died out that piracy was dead. If we tear down a wasp's nest, we destroy the abode of a fierce and pitiless community. But we scatter the wasps, and it is likely that each one of them, in the unrestricted and irresponsible career to which he has been unwillingly forced, will prove a much more angry and dangerous insect than he had ever been before. This is what happened to these buccaneers who would not give up a piratical life driven away from jamaica from san domingo and even from tortuga they retained a resting-place only at new providence an island in the bahamas and this they did not maintain very long then they spread themselves all over the watery world they were no longer buccaneers they were no longer brothers of any sort or kind they no longer set out merely to pillage and fight the spaniards but their attacks were made upon people of every nation English ships and French ships, once safe from them, were a welcome prey to these new pirates, unrestrained by any kind of loyalty, even by any kind of enmity. They were more rapacious, they were more cruel, they were more like fiends than they had ever been before. They were cowardly, and they no longer proceeded against towns which might be defended, nor ran up alongside of a man-of-war to boldly board her in the very teeth of her guns. They confined themselves to attacks upon peaceable merchant vessels, often robbing them and then scuttling them, delighted with the spectacle of a ship, with all its crew, sinking hopelessly into the sea. The scene of piratical operations in America was now very much changed. The successors of the brothers of the coast, no longer united by any bonds of fellowship, but each pirate captain acting independently in his own wicked way, was coming up from the West Indies to afflict the sea-coast of our country. The old buccaneers knew all about our southern coast, for they were among the very first white men who ever set foot on the shores of North and South Carolina before that region had been settled by colonists, and when the only inhabitants were the wild Indians. These early buccaneers often used its bays and harbors as convenient ports of refuge, 
where they could anchor, divide spoils, take in fresh water, and stay as long as they pleased without fear of molestation. It was natural enough that when the Spanish-hating buccaneer merged into the independent pirate, who respected no flag, and preyed upon ships of every nation, he should feel very much at home on the Carolina coasts. As the country was settled, and Charlestown, now Charleston, grew to be a port of considerable importance, the pirates felt as much at home in this region as when it was inhabited merely by Indians. They frequently touched at little seaside settlements, and boldly sailed into the harbor of Charlestown. But, unlike the unfortunate citizens of Porto Bello or Maracaibo, the American colonists were not frightened when they saw a pirate ship anchored in their harbors, for they knew its crew did not come as enemies, but as friendly traders. The early English colonists were not as prosperous as they might have been if the mother country had not been so anxious to make money out of them. They were not allowed to import goods from any country but England, and if they had products or crops to export, they must be sold to English merchants. For whatever they bought they had to pay the highest prices, and they could not send into the markets of the world to get the best value for their own productions. Therefore it was that a pirate ship was a very welcome visitor in Charlestown Harbor. She was generally loaded with goods, which, as they were stolen, her captain could afford to sell very cheaply indeed. And as there was always plenty of Spanish gold on board, her crew was not apt to haggle very much in regard to the price of the spirits, the groceries, or the provisions which they bought from the merchants of the town. This friendly commerce between the pirates and the Carolinians grew to be so extensive that at one time the larger part of the coin in circulation in those colonies consisted of Spanish gold pieces, which had been brought in and used by the pirates for the purchase of goods. But a pirate is very seldom a person of discretion, who knows when to leave well enough alone, and so, instead of contenting themselves with robbing and capturing the vessels belonging to the people whom their Charlestown friends and customers would look upon as foreigners, they boldly sailed up and down the coast, seeking for floating booty wherever they might find it. And when a pirate vessel commanded by an English captain and manned principally by an English crew, fell in with a big merchantman flying the English flag, they bore down upon that vessel, just as if it had been French or Spanish or Dutch, and if the crew were impertinent enough to offer any resistance, they were cut down and thrown overboard. At last the pirates became so swaggeringly bold and their captains so enterprising in their illegal trading that the English government took vigorous measures, not only to break up piracy, but to punish all colonists who should encourage the freebooters by commercial dealings with them. At these laws the pirates laughed, and the colonists winced, and there were many people in Charlestown who vowed that if the king wanted them to help him put down piracy, he must show them some other way of getting imported goods at reasonable prices. So the pirates went on capturing merchantmen whenever they had a chance and the Carolinians continued to look forward with interest to the bargain days which always followed the arrival of a pirate ship. But this state of things did not last, and the time came when the people of Charlestown experienced a change of mind. The planters were now growing large quantities of rice, and this crop became so valuable that the prosperity of the colonies greatly increased, and now the pirates also became very much interested in the rice crops and when they had captured four or five vessels sailing out of Charlestown heavily laden with rice, the people of that town suddenly became aware of the true character of a pirate. He was now in their eyes an unmitigated scoundrel who not only stole goods from all nations, which he brought to them and sold at low prices, but he actually stole their goods, their precious rice which they were sending to England. The indignant citizens of Charlestown took a bold stand, and such a bold one it was that when part of a crew of pirates who had been put ashore by their comrades on account of a quarrel made their way to the town, thinking they could tell a tale of shipwreck and rely upon the friendship of their old customers, they were taken into custody, and seven out of the nine were hanged. The occasional repetition of such acts as this, and the exhibition of dangling pirates, hung up like scarecrows at the entrance of the harbors, dampened the ardor of the freebooters a good deal, and for some years they kept away from the harbor of Charlestown, which had once been to them such a friendly port. 
End of chapter 21 Read by Sandra in Wales, United Kingdom July 2006
were anxious to keep out of his way. On one of his voyages Blackbeard went down the coast as far as Honduras, where he took a good many prizes, and as some of the crews of the captured vessels enlisted under him, he sailed north with a larger force than ever before, having a large strip of forty guns, three smaller vessels, and four hundred men. With this little fleet, Blackbeard made for the coast of South Carolina, and anchored outside the harbor of Charlestown. He well understood the present condition of the place, and was not in the least afraid that the citizens would hang him up on the shores of the bay. Blackbeard began work without delay. Several well-laden ships, the Carolinians having no idea that pirates were waiting for them, came sailing out to sea and were immediately captured. One of these was a very important vessel, for it not only carried a valuable cargo, but a number of passengers, many of them people of note, who were on their way to England. One of these was a Mr. Rag, who was a member of the Council of the Province. It might have been supposed that when Blackbeard took possession of this ship, he would have been satisfied with the cargo and the money which he found on board, and having no use for prominent citizens, would have let them go their way. But he was a trader as well as a plunderer, and he therefore determined that the best thing to do in this case was to put an assorted lot of highly respectable passengers upon the market, and see what he could get for them. He was not, at the time, in need of money or provisions, but his men were very much in want of medicines, so he decided to trade off his prisoners for pills, potions, plasters, and all sorts of apothecary supplies. He put three of his pirates in a boat, and with them one of the passengers of Mr. Marks, who was commissioned as Blackbeard's special agent, with orders to inform the governor that if he did not immediately send the medicines required, amounting in value to about three hundred pounds, and if he did not allow the pirate crew of the boat to return in safety, every one of the prisoners would be hanged from the yard-arm of his ship. The boat rowed away to the distant town, and Blackbeard waited two days for its return, and then he grew very angry, for he believed that his messengers had been taken into custody, and he came very near hanging Mr. Rag and all his companions. But before he began to satisfy his vengeance, news came from the boat. It had been upset in the bay, and had had great trouble in getting to Charlestown, but it had arrived there at last. Blackbeard now waited a day or two longer, but as no news came from Mr. Marks, he vowed he would not be trifled with by the impudent people of Charlestown, and swore that every man, woman, and child among the prisoners should immediately prepare to be hanged. Of course, the unfortunate prisoners in the pirate ship were in a terrible state of mind during the absence of Mr. Marks. They knew very well that they could expect no mercy from Blackbeard if the errand should be unsuccessful and they also knew that the Charlestown people would not be likely to submit to such an outrageous demand upon them. So they trembled, and they quaked by day and by night. And when at last they were told to get ready to be hanged, every particle of courage left them, and they proposed to Blackbeard that if he would spare their lives, and that if it should turn out that their fellow citizens had decided to sacrifice them for the sake of a few paltry drugs, they would take up the cause of the pirates. They would show Blackbeard the best way to sail into the harbor, and they would join with him and his men in attacking the city and punishing the inhabitants for their hard-hearted treatment of their unfortunate fellow citizens. This proposition pleased Blackbeard immensely. It would have been like a new game— to take Mr. Rag to the town, and make him fight his fellow members of the council of the province. And so he rescinded his order for a general execution, and bade his prisoners prepare to join with his pirates, when he should give the word for an assault upon their city. In the meantime, 
There was a terrible stir in Charlestown. When the governor and citizens received the insolent and brutal message of Blackbeard, they were filled with rage as well as consternation, and if there had been any way of going out to sea to rescue their unhappy fellow-citizens, every able-bodied man in the town would have enlisted in the expedition. But they had no vessels of war, and they were not even in a position to arm any of the merchantmen in the harbor. It seemed to the governor and his council that there was nothing for them to do but to submit to the demands of Blackbeard, for they knew very well that he was a scoundrel who would keep his word, and also that whatever they did must be done quickly, for there were the three swaggering pirates in the town, strutting around the streets as if they owned the place. If this continued much longer, it would be impossible to keep the infuriated citizens from falling upon these blustering rascals, and bringing their impertinence to a summary end. If this should happen, it would be a terrible thing, for not only would Mr. Rag and his companions be put to death, but the pirates would undoubtedly attack the town, which was in a very poor position for defense. Consequently, the drugs were collected with all possible haste, and Mr. Marks and the pirates were sent with them to Blackbeard. We do not know whether or not that bedizened cutthroat was satisfied with the way things turned out, for, having had the idea of going to Charlestown and obliging the prisoners to help him confiscate the drugs and chemicals, he may have preferred this unusual proceeding to a more commonplace transaction. But, as the medicine had arrived, he accepted it, and, having secured all possible booty and money from the ships he had captured, and had stripped his prisoners of the greater part of their clothing, he set them on shore to walk to Charlestown as well as they could. They had a miserably difficult time, making their way through the woods and marshes, for there were women and children among them who were scarcely equal to the journey. One of the children was a little boy, the son of Mr. Rag, who afterward became a very prominent man in the colonies. He rose to such a high position, not only among his countrymen, but in the opinion of the English government, that when he died, about the beginning of the Revolution, a tablet to his memory was placed in Westminster Abbey, which is, perhaps, the first instance of such an honor being paid to an American. Having now provided himself with medicines enough to keep his wild crew in good physical condition, no matter how much they might feast and frolic on the booty they had obtained from Charlestown, Blackbeard sailed back to his North Carolina haunts, and took a long vacation, during which time he managed to put himself on very good terms with the governor and officials of the country. He had plenty of money, and was willing to spend it, and so he was allowed to do pretty much as he pleased, provided he kept his purse open, and did not steal from his neighbors. But Blackbeard became tired of playing the part of a make-believe respectable citizen, and having spent the greater part of his money, he wanted to make some more. Consequently, he fitted out a small vessel, and declaring that he was going on a legitimate commercial cruise, he took out regular papers for a port in the West Indies, and sailed away, as if he had been a mild-mannered New England mariner going to catch codfish. The officials of the town of Bath, from which he sailed, came down to the ship and shook hands with him, and hoped he would have good success. After a moderate absence, he returned to Bath, bringing with him a large French merchant vessel, with no people on board, but loaded with a valuable cargo of sugar and other goods. This vessel, he declared, he had found deserted at sea, and he therefore claimed it as a legitimate prize. Knowing the character of this bloody pirate, and knowing how very improbable it was that the captain and all the crew of a valuable merchant vessel, with nothing whatever the matter with her, would go into their boats and row away, leaving their ship to become the property of 
anyone who might happen along, it may seem surprising that the officials of Bath appeared to have no doubt of the truth of Blackbeard's story, and allowed him freely to land the cargo on the French ship and store it away as his own property. But people who consort with pirates cannot be expected to have very lively consciences, and although there must have been persons in the town with intelligence enough to understand the story of pitiless murder told by that empty vessel, whose very decks and masts must have been regarded as silent witnesses that her captain and crew did not leave her of their own free will, no one in the town interfered with the thrifty Blackbeard, or caused any public suspicion to fall upon the property of his actions. End of chapter 22 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Summer 2006
and manned them with the best fighting men from the war vessels. One of the sloops he put under Captain Brand, and the other under Captain Maynard, both brave and experienced naval officers. All preparations were made with the greatest secrecy, for if Blackbeard had heard of what was going on, he would probably have decamped. And then the two sloops went out to sea with a commission from the governor to capture Blackbeard, dead or alive. This was a pretty heavy contract, but Brand and Maynard were courageous men, and did not hesitate to take it. The Virginians had been informed that the pirate captain and his men were on a vessel in Ocracoke Inlet, and when they arrived they found, to their delight, that Blackbeard was there. When the pirates saw the two armed vessels sailing into the inlet, they knew very well that they were about to be attacked, and it did not take them long to get ready for a fight, nor did they wait to see what their enemy was about to do. As soon as the sloops were near enough, Blackbeard, without waiting for any preliminary exercises, such as a demand for surrender or any nonsense of that sort, let drive at the intruders with eight heavily loaded cannon. Now the curtain had been rung up, and the play began, and a very lively play it was. The guns of the Virginians blazed away at the pirate ship, and they would have sent out boats to board her, had not Blackbeard forestalled them. Boarding was always a favorite method of fighting with the pirates. They did not often carry heavy cannon, and even when they did, they had but little fancy for battles at long distances. What they liked was to meet foes face to face, and cut them down on their own decks. In such combats they felt at home, and were almost always successful, for there were very few mariners or sailors, even in the British Navy, who could stand away against these brawny, glary-eyed daredevils, who sprang over the sides of a vessel like panthers, and fought like bulldogs. Blackbeard had had enough cannonading, and he did not wait to be boarded. Springing into a boat with about twenty of his men, he rowed to the vessel commanded by Maynard, and, in a few minutes, he and his pirates surged on board her. Now there followed on the decks of that sloop one of the most fearful hand-to-hand -hand combats known to naval history. Pirates had often attacked vessels where they met with strong resistance, but never had a gang of sea-robbers fallen in with such bold and skilled antagonists as those who now confronted Blackbeard and his crew. At it they went, cut, fire, slash, bang, howl, and shout. Steel clashed, pistols blazed, smoke went up, and blood ran down, and it was hard in the confusion for a man to tell friend from foe. Blackbeard was everywhere, bounding from side to side as he swung his cutlass high and low, and though many a shot was fired at him, and many a rush made in his direction, every now and then a sailor went down beneath his whirling blade. But the great pirate had not boarded that ship to fight with common men. He was looking for Maynard, the commander. Soon he met him, and for the first time in his life he found his match. Maynard was a practice swordsman, and no matter how hard and how swiftly came down the cutlass of the pirate, his strokes were always evaded, and the sword of the Virginian played more dangerously near him. At last Blackbeard, finding that he could not cut down his enemy, suddenly drew a pistol, and was about to empty its barrels into the very face of his opponent, when Maynard sent his sword-blade into the throat of the furious pirate. The great Blackbeard went down upon his back on the deck, and in the next moment Maynard put an end to his nefarious career. Their leader dead, the few pirates who were left alive gave up the fight, and sprang overboard, hoping to be able to swim ashore, and the victory of the Virginians was complete. The strength, toughness, and extraordinary vitality of these feline human beings, who were known as pirates, has often occasioned astonishment in ordinary people. 
Their sun-tanned and hairy bodies seemed to be made of something like wire, leather, and India rubber, upon which the most tremendous exertions, and even the infliction of severe wounds, made but little impression. Before Blackbeard fell, he received from Maynard and others no less than twenty-five wounds, and yet he fought fearlessly to the last, and when the panting officer sheathed his sword, he felt that he had performed a most signal deed of valor. When they had broken up the pirate nest in Ocracoke Inlet, the two sloops sailed to Bath, where they compelled some of the unscrupulous town officials to surrender the cargo, which had been stolen from the French vessel, and stowed in the town by Blackbeard. Then they sailed proudly back to Hampton Roads, with the head of the dreaded Blackbeard dangling from the end of the bowsprit of the vessel he had boarded, and on whose deck he had discovered the fact, before unknown to him, that a well-trained, honest man can fight as well as the most reckless cutthroat who ever decked his beard with ribbons, and swore enmity to all things good. End of chapter 23 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Summer, 2006 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Wilcox Buccaneers and the Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton Chapter 24 A Greenhorn Under the Black Flag Early in the 18th century, there lived at Bridgetown, in the island of Barbados, a very pleasant, middle-aged gentleman named Major Stead Bonnet. He was a man in comfortable circumstances, and had been an officer in the British Army. He had retired from military service, and had bought an estate at Bridgetown where he lived in comfort and was respected by his neighbors. But for some reason or other, this quiet and reputable gentleman got it into his head that he would like to be a pirate. There were some persons who said that this strange fancy was due to the fact that his wife did not make his home pleasant for him, but it is quite certain that if a man wants an excuse for robbing and murdering his fellow beings, he ought to have a much better one than the bad temper of his wife. But besides the general reasons why Major Bonnet should not become a pirate, which applied to all men as well as himself, there was a special reason against his adoption of the profession of a sea robber, for he was an out-and-out -out landsman and knew nothing whatever of nautical matters. He had been at sea but very little, and if he had heard a Bonson order his men to furl the keel, to batten down the shrouds, or to hoist the four chains to the topmost yard, he would have seen nothing out of the way in these commands. He was very fond of history, and very well read in the literature of the day. He was accustomed to the habits of good society, and knew a great deal about farming and horses, cows and poultry, but if he had been compelled to steer a vessel, he would not have known how to keep her bow ahead of her stern. But notwithstanding this absolute incapacity for such a life, and the absence of any of the ordinary motives for abandoning respectability and entering upon a career of crime, Major Bonnet was determined to become a pirate, and he became one. He had money enough to buy a ship and to fit her out and man her, 
and this he quietly did at Bridgetown, nobody supposing that he was going to do anything more than start off on some commercial cruise. When everything was ready, his vessel slipped out of the harbor one night, and after he was sailing safely on the rolling sea, he stood upon the quarter deck and proclaimed himself a pirate. It might not be supposed that this was necessary, for the seventy men on board his ship were all desperate cutthroats of various nationalities whom he had found in the little port and who knew very well what was expected of them when they reached the sea. But if Steve Bonnet had not proclaimed himself a pirate, it is possible that he might not have believed himself that he was one, so he ran up the black flag. With its skeleton or skull and crossbones, he girded on a great cutlass and folding his arms, he ordered his mate to steer the vessel to the coast of Virginia. Although Bonnet knew so little about ships and the sea and had had no experience in piracy, his men were practiced seamen and many of them who had not been pirates before were quite ready and very well fitted to become such. So when this green hand came into the waters of Virginia, he actually took two or three vessels and robbed them of their cargoes, burning the ships and sending the crews on shore. This had grown to be a common custom among the pirates, who, though crew and hard-hearted, had not the inducement of the old buccaneers to torture and murder the crews of the vessels which they captured. They could not hate human beings in general as buccaneers hated the Spaniards, so they were a little more humane to their prisoners, setting them ashore on some island or desert coast and letting them shift for themselves as best as they might. This was called marooning and was somewhat less heartless than the old methods of getting rid of undesirable prisoners by drowning or beheading them. As Bonnet had always been rather conventional in his ideas and had respected the customs of the society in which he found himself, he now adopted all the piratical fashions of the day, and when he found himself too far from land to put the captured crew on shore, he did not hesitate to make them walk the plank, which was a favorite device of the pirates whenever they had no other way of disposing of their prisoners. The unfortunate wretches, with their hands tied behind them, were compelled one by one to mount a plank which was projected over the side of the vessel and balanced like a seesaw, and when, prodded by knives and cutlasses, they stepped out upon this plank, of course it tipped up, and down they went into the sea. In this way, men, women, and children slipped out of sight among the waves as the vessel sailed merrily on. In one branch of his new profession, Bonnet rapidly became proficient. He was an insatiable robber and a cruel conqueror. He captured merchant vessels all along the coast, as high up as New England, and then he came down again and stopped for a while before Charlestown Harbor, where he took a couple of prizes and then put into one of the North Carolina harbors where it was always easy for a pirate vessel to refit and get ready for further adventures. Bonnet's vessel was named the Revenge, which was about as ill-suited to the vessel as her commander was ill-fitted to sail her, for Bonnet had nobody to revenge himself upon, unless indeed it was his scolding wife. But a good many pirate ships were then called the Revenge and Bonnet was bound to follow the fashion, whatever it might be. Very soon after he had stood upon the quarter deck and proclaimed himself a pirate, his men had discovered that he knew no more about sailing than he knew about painting portraits, and although there were under officers who directed all the nautical operations, the mass of the crew conceived a great contempt for a landsman captain. There was much grumbling and growling, and many of the men would have been glad to throw Bonnet overboard and take the ship into their own hands. But when any symptoms of mutiny showed themselves, the pirates found 
that although they did not have a sailor in command over them, they had a very determined and relentless master. Bonnet knew that the captain of a pirate ship ought to be the most severe and rigid man on board, and so at the slightest sign of insubordination, his grumbling men were put in chains or flogged, and it was Bonnet's habit at such times to strut about the deck with loaded pistols, threatening to blow out the brains of any man who dared to disobey him. Recognizing that although their captain was no sailor, he was a first-class tyrant, and the rebellious crew kept their grumbling to themselves and worked his ship. Bonnet now pointed the bow of the revenge southward, that is, he requested somebody else to see it was done, and sailed to the Bay of Honduras, which was a favorite resort of the pirates about that time. And there it was that he first met with the famous Captain Blackbeard. There was no doubt that our amateur pirate was very glad indeed to become acquainted with this well-known professional, and they soon became good friends. Blackbeard was on the point of organizing an expedition, and he proposed that Bonnet and his vessel should join it. This invitation was gladly accepted, and the two pirate captains started out on a cruise together. Now the old reprobate Blackbeard knew everything about ships and was a good navigator, and it was not long before he discovered that his new partner was as green as grass in regard to all nautical affairs. Consequently, after having fought the matter over for a time, he made up his mind that Bonnet was not at all fitted to command such a fine vessel as the one he owned and had fitted out, and as pirates make their own laws, perhaps do not obey them if they happen not to feel like it. Blackbeard sent for Bonnet to come on board his ship, and then, in a manner as cold-blooded as if he had been out about to cut down a helpless prisoner, Blackbeard told Bonnet that he was not fitted to be a pirate captain, that he intended to keep him on board his own vessel, and that he should send somebody to take charge of the revenge. It was a fall indeed, and Bonnet was almost stunned by it. An hour before, he had been proudly strutting about on the deck of a vessel which belonged to him, and in which he had captured many valuable prizes, and now he was told he was to stay on Blackbeard's ship and make himself useful in keeping the log book or doing any other easy thing which he might happen to understand. The green pirate ground his teeth and swore bitterly inside of himself, but he said nothing openly. On Blackbeard's ship, Blackbeard's decisions were not to be questioned. End of chapter 24「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Wilcox Buccaneers and the Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton Chapter 25 Bonnet Again to the Front it must not be supposed that the late commander of the Revenge continued to be satisfied as he sat in the cabin of Blackbeard's vessel and made the entries of the day's sailing and various performances. He obeyed the orders of his usurping partner because he was obliged to do so, but he did not hate Blackbeard any the less because he had to keep quiet about it. He accompanied his pirate chief on various cruises, among which was a famous expedition to the harbor of Charlestown, where Blackbeard traded Mr. Rag and his companions for some medicine. Having a very fine fleet under him, Blackbeard did a very successful business for some time, but feeling that he had earned enough for the present, and that it was time for him to take one of his vacations, 
he put into an inlet in North Carolina, where he disbanded his crew. So long as he was on shore spending his money and having a good time, he did not want to have a lot of men about him who would look to him to support them when they had spent their portion of the spoils. Having no further use for Bonnet, he dismissed him also and did not object to his resuming possession of his own vessel. If the green pirate chose to go to sea again and perhaps drown himself and his crew, it was a matter of no concern to Blackbeard. But this was a matter of very great concern to Steve Bonnet, and he proceeded to prove that there were certain branches of the piratical business in which he was adept, and second to none of his fellow proprietors. He wished to go pirating again, and saw a way of doing this which he thought would be far superior to any of the common methods. It was about this time that King George of England, very desirous of breaking up piracy, issued a proclamation in which he promised pardon to any pirate who would appear before the proper authorities, renounce his evil practices, and take an oath of allegiance. It also happened that, very soon after this proclamation had been issued, England went to war with Spain. Being a man who kept himself posted in the news of the world, so far as it was possible, Bonnet saw in the present state of affairs a very good chance for him to play the part of a wolf in sheep's clothing, so he proceeded to begin his new piratical career by renouncing piracy. So leaving the revenge in the inlet, he journeyed over land to Bath, where he signed pledges, took oaths, and did everything that was necessary to change himself from a pirate captain to a respectable commander in a duly authorized British privateer. Returning to his vessel with all the papers in his pocket necessary to prove he was a loyal and law-abiding subject of Great Britain, he took out regular clearance papers for St. Thomas, which was a British naval station, and where he declared he was going in order to obtain a commission as a privateer. Now the wily Bonnet had everything he wanted except for a crew. Of course it would not do for him in his present respectable capacity to go about enlisting unemployed pirates. But at this point fortune again favored him. He knew of a desert island not very far away where Blackbeard, at the end of his last cruise, had marooned a large party of his men. This heartless pirate had not wanted to take all of his followers into port, because they might prove troublesome and expensive to him, so he had put a number of them on this island, to live or die as the case might be. Bonnet went over to this island, and finding the greater part of these men still surviving, he offered to take them to St. Thomas in his vessel if they would agree to work the ship to port. This proposition was, of course, joyfully accepted, and very soon the revenge was manned with a complete crew of competent desperadoes. All these operations took a great deal of time, and at last, when everything was ready for Bonnet to start out on his piratical cruise, he received information which caused him to change his mind and to set forth an errand of a very different kind. He had supposed that Blackbeard, whom he had never forgiven for the shameful and treacherous manner in which he had treated him, was still on shore enjoying himself, but he was told by the captain of a small trading vessel that the old pirate was preparing for another cruise and that he was then in Okarakoke Inlet. Now Bonnet folded his arms and stamped his feet upon the quarter-deck. The time had come for him to show that the name of his vessel meant something. Never before had he had an opportunity for revenging himself on anybody. But now that hour has arrived. He would revenge himself upon Blackbeard. The implicable Bonnet sailed out to sea in a truly warlike frame of mind. He was not going forth to prey upon unresisting merchantmen, 
He was on his way to punish a black-hearted pirate, a faithless scoundrel, who had not only acted knavishly toward the world in vain, but had behaved most disloyally and disrespectfully toward a fellow pirate chief. If he could once run the revenge alongside the ship of the perfidious Blackbeard, he would show him what a green hand could do. When Bonnet reached Ocracoke Inlet, he was deeply disappointed to find that Blackbeard had left that harbor, but he did not give up the pursuit. He made hot chase after the vessel of his private enemy, keeping a sharp lookout in hopes of discovering some signs of him. If the enraged Bonnet would have met the ferocious Blackbeard face to face, there might have been a combat which would have relieved the world of two atrocious villains, and Captain Mainyard would have been deprived of the honor of having slain the most famous pirate of the day. Bonnet was a good soldier and a very brave man, and although he could not sail a ship, he understood the use of the sword even better, perhaps, than Blackbeard, and there is good reason to believe that if the two ships had come together, their respective crews would have allowed their captains to fight out their private quarrel without interference, for pirates delight in a bloody spectacle, and this would have been to them a rare diversion of the kind. But Bonnet never overtook Blackbeard, and the great combat between the rival pirates did not take place. Only after vainly searching for a considerable time for a trace or sight of Blackbeard, the baffled Bonnet gave up the pursuit and changed his mind to other objects. The first thing he did was to change the name of his vessel. If he could not be revenged, he would not sail in the revenge. Casting about in his mind for a good name, he decided to call her the Royal James. Having no intention of respecting his oaths or of keeping his promises, he thought that, as he was going to be disloyal, he might as well be as disloyal as he could. So he gave his ship the name assumed by the son of James the Second, who was a pretender to the throne, and was then in France plotting against the English government. The next thing he did was to change his own name, for he thought this would make matters better for him if he should be captured after entering upon his new criminal career. So he called himself Captain Thomas, by which name he was afterwards known. When these preliminaries had been arranged, he gathered his crew together and announced that instead of going to St. Thomas to get a commission as a privateer, he had determined to keep on in his old manner of life, and that he wished them to understand that not only was he a pirate captain, but that they were a pirate crew. Many of the men were very much surprised at this announcement, for they had thought a very natural thing for the green hand bonnet to give up pirating after he had been so thoroughly snubbed by Blackbeard, and they had not supposed that he would ever think again of sailing under a black flag. However, the crew's opinion of the green hand captain had been a good deal changed. In his various cruises, he had learned a great deal about navigation and could now give very fair orders, and his furious pursuit of Blackbeard had also given him a reputation for reckless bravery which he had not enjoyed before. A man who was chafing and fuming for a chance of a hand-to-hand -hand conflict with the greatest pirate of the day must be a pretty good sort of fellow from their point of view. Moreover, their strutting and stalking captain, so recently balked of his dark revenge, was a very savage-looking man, and it would not be pleasant either to try to persuade him to give up his piratical intention or to decline to join him in carrying it out. So the whole of the crew, minor officers and men, 
changed their minds about going to St. Thomas and agreed to hoist the skull and crossbones and to follow Captain Bonnet wherever he might lead. Bonnet now cruised about in grand style and took some prizes on the Virginia coast and then went up into Delaware Bay where he captured such ships as he wanted and acted generally in the most domineering and insolent fashion. Once, when he stopped near the town of Lewis, in order to send some prisoners ashore, he sent a message to the officers of the town to the effect that if they interfered with his men when they came ashore he would open fire upon the town with his cannon and blow every house into splinters of course the citizens having no way of defending themselves were obliged to allow the pirates to come on shore and depart unmolested then after this blustering captain captured two valuable sloops and wishing to take them along with him without the trouble of transferring their cargoes to his own vessel he left their crews on board and ordered them to follow him wherever he went some days after that when one of the vessels seemed to be sailing at too great a distance bonnet quickly let her captain know that he was not a man to be trifled with and sent him the message that if he did not keep close to the royal james he would fire into him and sink him to the bottom after a time bonnet put into a north carolina port in order to repair the royal james which was becoming very leaky and seeing no immediate legitimate way of getting planks and beams enough with which to make the necessary repairs he captured a small sloop belonging in a neighborhood and broke it up in order to get the material he needed to make his own vessel seaworthy now the people of the north carolina coast very seldom interfered with pirates as we have seen and it is likely that bonnet might have stayed in port as long as he pleased and repaired and refitted his vessel without molestation if he had bought and paid for the planks and the timber he required but when it came to boldly seizing their property this was too much even for the people of the region and the complaints of bonnet's behavior spread from settlement to settlement and it very soon became known all down the coast that there was a pirate in north carolina who was committing depredations there and was preparing to set out on a fresh cruise when the tidings came to charlestown the citizens were thrown into great agitation it had not been long since blackbeard had visited their harbor and had treated them with such brutal insolence and there were both spirits in town who declared that if any effort by them could prevent another visitation of the pirates that effort should be made there was no naval force in the harbor which could be sent out to meet the pirates who were coming down the coast but mr william ratt a gentleman of position in a place went to the governor and offered to fit out at his own expense an expedition for the purpose of turning away from their city the danger which threatened it end of chapter twenty five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buccaneers and the Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton. Chapter 26 The Battle of the Sandbars. When that estimable private gentleman, Mr. William Rett, of Charlestown, had received a commission from the governor to go forth on his own responsibility and meet the dreaded pirate, the news of whose depredations had thrown the good citizens into such a fever of apprehension, he took possession, in the name of the law, of two large sloops, the Henry and the Sea Nymph, which were in the harbor, and at his own expense he manned them, with well-armed crews, and put on board of each of them eight small cannon. When everything was ready, Mr. Rett was in command of a very formidable force for those waters, 
and if he had been ready to sail a few days sooner, he would have had an opportunity of giving his men some practice in fighting pirates before they met the particular and more important sea robber whom they had set out to encounter. Just as his vessel was ready to sail, Mr. Rhett received news that a pirate ship had captured two or three merchantmen just outside the harbor, and he was put out to sea with all possible haste and cruised up and down the coast for some time. But he did not find this most recent depredator, who had departed very promptly when he heard that armed ships were coming out of the harbor. Now Mr. Rhett, who was no more of a sailor than Stade Bonnet had been when he first began his seafaring life, boldly made his way up the coast to the mouth of Cape Fear River, where he had been told the pirate vessel was lying. When he reached his destination, Mr. Rhett found that it would not be an easy thing to ascend the river, for the reason that the pilots he had brought with him knew nothing about the waters of that part of the coast. And although the two ships made their way very cautiously, it was not long after they had entered the river before they got out of the channel, and it being low tide, both of them ran aground upon sandbars. This was a very annoying accident, but it was not disastrous, for the sailing-masters who commanded the sloops knew very well that when the tide rose their vessels would float again, but it prevented Mr. Rhett from going on and making an immediate attack upon the pirate vessel, the top masts of which could be plainly seen behind a high headland some distance up the river. Of course Bonnet, or Captain Thomas, as he now chose to be called, soon became aware of the fact that two good-sized vessels were lying around near the mouth of the river, and having a very natural curiosity to see what sort of craft they were, he waited until nightfall, and then sent three armed boats to make observations. When the boats returned to the Royal James, and reported that the grounded vessels were not well-loaded trading craft, but large sloops full of men and armed with cannon, Bonnet, for we prefer to call him by his old name, had good reasons to fold his arms, knit his brows, and strut up and down the deck. He was sure that the armed vessels came from Charlestown, and there was no reason to doubt that if the governor of South Carolina had sent two ships against him, the matter was a very serious one. He was pent up in the river. He had only one fighting vessel to contend against two, and if he could not succeed in getting out to sea before he should be attacked by the Charlestown ships, there would be little chance of his continuing in his present line of business. If the Royal James had been ready to sail, there is no doubt that Bonnet would have taken his chance of finding the channel in the dark, and would have sailed away that night, without regard to the cannonading which might have been directed against him from the two stranded vessels. But, as it was impossible to get ready to sail, Bonnet went to work with the greatest energy to get ready to fight. He knew that when the tide rose there would be two armed sloops afloat, and that there would be a regular naval battle on the quiet waters of Cape Fear River. All night his men worked to clear the decks and get everything in order for the coming combat, and all that night Mr. Rhett and his crews kept a sharp watch for any unexpected move of the enemy while they loaded their guns, their pistols, and their cannon, and put everything in order for action. Very early in the morning the wide-awake crews of the South Carolina vessels, which were now afloat and at anchor, saw that the topmasts of the pirate craft were beginning to move above the distant headland, and very soon Bonnet's ship came out into view, under full sail, and as she veered around they saw that she was coming toward them. Up went the anchors, and up went the sails of the Henry and the Sea Nymph, and the naval battle between the retired army officer, who had almost learned to be a sailor, and the private gentleman from South Carolina, who knew nothing whatever about managing ships, was about to begin. It was plain to the South Carolinians that the great object of the pirate captain was to get out to sea just as soon as he could, and that he was coming down the river not because he wished to make an immediate attack upon them, but because he hoped to slip by them and get away. Of course they could follow him upon the ocean and fight him if their vessels were fast enough, but once out of the river with plenty of sea-room he would have twenty chances of escape, where now he had one. But Mr. Rhett did not intend that the pirates should play him this little trick. He wanted to fight the dastardly wretches in this river, where they could not get away, and he had no idea of letting them sneak out to sea. Consequently, as the Royal James, under full sail, was making her way down the river, keeping as far as possible from her two enemies, Mr. Rhett ordered his ships to bear down upon her, so as to cut off her retreat, and force her toward the opposite shore of the river. This manoeuvre was performed with great success, 
the two Charlestown sloops sailed so boldly and swiftly toward the Royal James that the latter was obliged to hug the shore, and the first thing the pirates knew they were stuck fast and tight upon a sandbar. Three minutes afterward the Henry ran upon a sandbar, and there being enough of these obstructions in that river to satisfy any ordinary demand, the sea nymph was very soon grounded herself upon another of them. But unfortunately she took up her permanent position at a considerable distance from her consort. Here now were the vessels which were to conduct this memorable sea fight, all three fast in the sand and unable to move, and the predicament was made the worse by the fact that it would be five hours before the tide would rise high enough for any one of them to float. The positions of the three vessels were very peculiar and awkward. The Henry and the Royal James were lying so near to each other that Mr. Rhett could have shot Major Bonnet with a pistol, if the latter gentleman had given him the chance, and the sea nymph was so far away that she was entirely out of the fight, and her crew could do nothing but stand and watch what was going on between the other two vessels. But although they could not get any nearer each other, nor get away from each other, the pirates and Mr. Rhett's crew had no idea of postponing the battle until they should be afloat, and able to fight in the ordinary fashion of ships. They immediately began to fire at each other with pistols, muskets, and cannon, and the din and roar was something that must have astonished the birds and beasts and fishes of that quiet region. As the tide continued to run out of the river, and its waters became more and more shallow, the two contending vessels began to careen over to one side, and unfortunately for the Henry, they both careened in the same direction, and in such a manner that the deck of the Royal James was inclined away from the Henry, while the deck of the latter leaned towards her pirate foe. This gave a great advantage to Bonnet and his crew, for they were in a great measure protected by the hull of their vessel, whereas the whole deck of the Henry was exposed to the fire of the pirates. But Mr. Rhett and his South Carolinians were all brave men, and they blazed away with their muskets and pistols at the pirates whenever they could see a head above the rail of the Royal James, while with their cannon they kept firing at the pirates' hull. For five long hours the fight continued, but the cannon carried by the two vessels must have been of a very small calibre, for if they had been firing at such short range and for such a length of time with modern guns, they must have shattered each other into kindling wood, but neither vessel seems to have been seriously injured, and although there were a good many men killed on both sides, the combat was kept up with great determination and fury. At one time it seemed almost certain that Bonnet would get the better of Mr. Rhett, and he ordered his black flag waved contemptuously in the air while his men shouted to the South Carolinians to come over and call upon them. But the South Carolina boys answered these taunts with cheers, and fired away more furiously than ever. The tide was now coming in, and everybody on board, the two fighting vessels, knew very well that the first one of them which should float would have a great advantage over the other, and would probably be the conqueror. In came the tide, and still the cannons roared, and the muskets cracked, while the hearts of the pirates and the South Carolinians almost stood still as they each watched the other vessel to see if she showed any signs of floating. At last such signs were seen. The Henry was further from the shore than the Royal James, and she first felt the influence of the rising waters. Her mass began to straighten, and at last her deck was level, and she floated clear of the bottom, while her antagonist still lay careened over on her side. Now the pirates saw there was no chance for them. In a very short time the other Carolina sloop would be afloat, and then the two vessels would bear down upon them, and utterly destroy both them and their vessel. Consequently, upon the Royal James, there was a general disposition to surrender, and to make the best terms they could, for it would be a great deal better to submit and run the chance of a trial, than to keep up the fight against enemies so much superior, both in numbers and ships, who would soon be upon them. But Bonnet would not listen to one word of surrender. Rather than give up the fight, he declared he would set fire to the powder magazine of the Royal James, and blow himself, his ship, and his men high up into the air. Although he had not a sailor's skill, he possessed a soldier's soul, and in spite of his being a dastardly and cruel pirate, he was a brave man. But Bonnet was only one, and his crew numbered dozens. And notwithstanding his furiously dissenting voice, it was determined to surrender, and when Mr. Rhett sailed up to the Royal James, intending to board her if the pirate still showed resistance, 
he found them ready to submit to terms and to yield themselves as his prisoners. Thus ended the great sea-fight between the private gentlemen, and thus ended stayed Bonnet's career. He and his men were taken to Charlestown, where most of the pirate crew were tried and executed. The green hand pirate, who had wrought more devastation along the American coast than many a skilled sea-robber, was held in custody to await his trial, and it seems very strange that there should have been a public sentiment in Charlestown which induced the officials to treat this pirate with a certain degree of respect, simply from the fact that his station in life had been that of a gentleman. He was much more a black-hearted scoundrel than any of his men, but they were executed as soon as possible while his trial was postponed, and he was allowed privileges which would never have been accorded a common pirate. In consequence of this leniency, he escaped and had to be retaken by Mr. Rett. It was so long before he was tried that sympathy for his misfortunes arose among some of the tender-hearted citizens of Charlestown, whose houses he would have pillaged and whose families he would have murdered if the exigencies of piracy had rendered such action desirable. Finding that other people were trying to save his life, Bonnet came down from his high horse and tried to save it himself, by writing piteous letters to the governor, begging for mercy. But the governor of South Carolina had no notion of sparing a pirate who had deliberately put himself under the protection of law in order that he might better pursue his lawless and wicked career. And the green hand with the black heart was finally hung on the same spot where his companions had been executed. End of chapter 26This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. Buccaneers and Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton. Chapter 27 A Six Weeks Pirate. About the time of Steed Bonnet's terminal adventures, a very unpretentious pirate made his appearance in the waters of New York. This was a man named Richard Worley, who set himself up in piracy in a very small way, but who, by a strict attention to business, soon achieved a remarkable success. He started out as a scourge upon the commerce of the Atlantic Ocean, with only an open boat and eight men. In this small craft he went down the coast of New Jersey, taking everything he could, from fishing boats and small trading vessels, until he reached Delaware Bay, and here he made a bold stroke, and captured a good-sized sloop. When this piratical outrage was reported at Philadelphia, it created a great sensation, and people talked about it until the open boat with nine men grew into a great pirate ship filled with roaring desperadoes and cutthroats. From Philadelphia the news was sent to New York, and that government was warned of the great danger which threatened the coast. As soon as this alarming intelligence was received, the New Yorkers set to work to get up an expedition which should go out to sea and endeavour to destroy the pirate vessel before it could enter their port and work havoc among their merchantmen. It may seem strange that a small open boat with nine men could stir up such a commotion in these two great provinces of North America, but if we can try to imagine the effect which would be produced among the inhabitants of Staten Island, or in the hearts of the dwellers in the beautiful houses on the shores of the Delaware River, by the announcement that a boat carrying nine desperate burglars was to be expected in their neighbourhood, we can better understand what the people of New York and Philadelphia thought when they heard that Worley had captured a sloop in Delaware Bay. The expedition which left New York made a very unsuccessful cruise. It sailed for days and days, but never saw a sign of a boat containing nine men and it returned disappointed and obliged to report no progress. With Worley, however, progress had been very decided. He captured another sloop, and this being a large one and suitable to his purposes, he took possession of it, gave up his open boat, and fitted out his prize as a regular piratical craft. With a good ship under his command, Captain Worley now enlarged his sphere of action. On both shores of Delaware Bay, and along the coast of New Jersey, he captured everything which came in his way, 
and for about three weeks he made the waters in those regions very hot for every kind of peaceable commercial craft. If Warley had been in trade, his motto would have been, Quick sales and small profits, for by day and by night the New York's Revenge, which was the name he gave to his new vessel, cruised east and west and north and south, losing no opportunity of levying contributions of money, merchandise, food and drink upon any vessel, no matter how insignificant it might be. The Philadelphians now began to tremble in their shoes, for if a boat had so quickly grown into a sloop, the sloop might grow into a fleet, and they had all heard of Portobello and the deeds of the bloody buccaneers. The governor of Pennsylvania, recognizing the impending danger and the necessity of prompt action, sent to Sandy Hook, where there was a British man of war, the Phoenix, and urged that this vessel should come down into Delaware Bay and put an end to the pirate ship which was ravaging those waters. Considering that Worley had not been engaged in piracy for much more than four weeks, he had created a reputation for enterprise and industry, which gave him a very important position as a commerce destroyer, and a large man of war did not think that he was too small game for her to hunt down, and so she set forth to capture or destroy the audacious Worley. But never a Worley of any kind did she see. While the Phoenix was sailing along the coast, examining all the coves and harbours of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, the New York's revenge put out to sea, and then proceeded southward to discover a more undisturbed field of operation. We will now leave Worley's vessel, sailing southward, and go for a time to Charlestown, where some very important events were taking place. The governor of South Carolina had been very much afraid that the pirates in general would take some sort of revenge for the capture of Steed Bonnet, who was then in prison awaiting trial, and that if he should be executed, Charlestown might be visited by an overpowering piratical force, and he applied to England to have a war vessel sent to the harbour. But before any relief of this kind could be expected, news came to Charlestown that already a celebrated pirate named Moody was outside of the harbour, capturing merchant vessels, and it might be that he was only waiting for the arrival of other pirate ships to sail into the harbour and rescue Bonnet. Now the Charlestown citizens saw that they must again act for themselves, and not depend on the home government. If there were pirates outside the harbour, they must be met and fought before they could come up into the city, and the governor and the council decided immediately to fit out a little fleet. Four merchant vessels were quickly provided with cannon, ammunition, and men, and the command of this expedition would undoubtedly have been given to Mr. Rett, had it not been that he and the governor had quarrelled. There being no naval officers in Charlestown, their fighting vessels had to be commanded by civilians and Governor Johnson now determined that he would try his hand at carrying on a sea-fight. Mr. Rett had done very well. Why should not he? Before the Governor's little fleet of vessels, one of which was the Royal James, captured from Bonnet, was quite ready to sail, the Governor received news that his preparations had not been made a moment too soon, for already two vessels, one a large ship and the other an armed sloop, had come into the outer harbour and were lying at anchor off Sullivan's Island. It was very likely that Moody, having returned from some outside operation, was waiting there for the arrival of other pirate ships, and that it was an important thing to attack him at once. As it was very desirable that the pirates should not be frightened away before the Charlestown fleet could reach them, the vessels of the latter were made to look as much like mere merchantmen as possible. The cannon were covered, and the greater part of the crews were kept below, out of sight. Thus the four ships came sailing down the bay and early in the morning made their appearance in the sight of the pirates. When the ship and the big sloop saw the four merchant vessels sailing quietly out of the harbour, they made immediate preparations to capture them. Anchors were weighed, sails were set, and with a black flag flying from the topmast of each vessel, the pirates steered towards the Charlestown fleet, and soon approached near enough to the King William, which was the foremost of the fleet, to call upon her captain to surrender. But at that moment Governor Johnson, who was on board the Mediterranean, and could hear the insolent pirate shouting through his speaking trumpet, gave a preconcerted signal. Instantly everything was changed. The covers were jerked off from the cannon of the pretended merchantmen, armed men poured up out of the holds, the flag of England was quickly raised on each one of them, and the sixty-eight guns of the combined fleet opened fire upon the astonished pirates. 
The ship, which had seemed to be the more formidable of the enemy's vessels, had run up so close to her intended prey that two of Governor Johnson's vessels, the Sea Nymph and the Royal James, once so bitterly opposed to each other, but now fighting together in honest comradeship, were able to go between her and the open sea and so cut off her retreat. But if the captain of the pirate ship could not get away, he showed that he was very well able to fight. And although the two vessels which had made him the object of their attack were pouring cannon balls and musket shot upon him, he blazed away with his cannon and his muskets. The three vessels were so near each other that sometimes their yard arms almost touched, so that this terrible fight seemed almost like a hand to hand conflict. For four hours the roaring of the cannon, the crushing of timbers, the almost continuous discharge of musketry were kept up. While the smoke of the battle frequently almost prevented the crews of the contending ships from seeing each other. Not so very far away, the people of Charlestown, who were standing on the shores of their beautiful harbour, could see the fierce fight which was going on, and great was the excitement and anxiety throughout the city. But the time came when two ships grew too much for one, and as the Royal James and the Sea Nymph were able to take positions by which they could rake the deck of the pirate vessel, Many of her men gave up the fight and rushed down into the hold to save their lives. Then both the Charlestown vessels bore down upon the pirate and boarded her, and now there was another savage battle with pistols and cutlasses. The pirate captain and several of his crew were still on deck, and they fought like wounded lions, and it was not until they had all been cut down or shot that victory came to the men of Charlestown. Very soon after this terrible battle was over, the waiting crowds in the city saw a glorious sight. The pirate ship came sailing slowly up the harbour, a captured vessel, with the sea nymph on one side and the royal James on the other, the colours of the crown flying from the masts of each one of the three. The other pirate ship, which was quite large, seemed to be more fortunate than her companion, for she was able to get out to sea, and spreading all her sails, she made every effort to escape. Governor Johnson, however, had no idea of letting her get away if he could help it. When a civilian goes out to fight a sea battle, he naturally wants to show what he can do, and Governor Johnson did not mean to let people think that Mr. Rett was a better naval commander than he was. He ordered the Mediterranean and the King William to put on all sail, and away they went after the big ship. The retreating pirates did everything they could to effect escape, throwing over their cannon and even their boats in order to lighten their ship. But it was of no use. The governor's vessels were the faster sailors, and when the King William got near enough to fire a few cannon balls into the flying ship, the latter hauled down the black flag, and without hesitation lay to and surrendered. It was plain enough that this ship was not manned by desperate pirates, and when Governor Johnson went on board of her, he found her to be not really a pirate ship, but an English vessel which not long before had been captured by the pirates, in whose company she had visited Charlestown Harbour. She had been bringing over from England a company of convicts, and what were called covenant servants, who were going to the colonies to be disposed of to the planters for a term of years. Among these were thirty six women, and when the South Carolinians went below, they were greatly surprised to find the hold crowded with these unfortunate creatures, some of whom were nearly frightened to death. At the time of this vessel's capture, the pirate captain had enlisted some of the convicts into his crew, as he needed men, and putting on board of his prize a few pirates to command her, the ship had been worked by such of her own crew and passengers as were willing to serve under pirates, while the others were shut up below. Here was a fine prize, taken with very little trouble, and the King William and the Mediterranean returned to Charlestown with their captured ship, to be met with the shouts and cheers of the delighted citizens, already excited to a high pitch by the previous arrival of the captured pirate sloop. But Governor Johnson met with something else, which made a stronger impression on him than the cheers of his townspeople, and this was the great surprise of finding that he had not fought and conquered the pirate Moody. Without suspecting such a thing, he had crushed and utterly annihilated the dreaded Warley, whose deeds had created such a consternation in northern waters, and whose threatened approach had sent a thrill of excitement all down the coast. When this astonishing news became known, the flags of the city were waved more wildly, and the shouts and cheers rose higher. Thus came to an end, in the short time of six weeks, the career of Richard Warley. Who, without doubt, did more piratical work, 
in less time than any sea robber on record. End of chapter 27
the three horseshoes, and were always glad when one of their customers came riding up to their stables, instead of simply walking in their door. But this domestic life did not last very long. Mary's husband died, and, not wishing to keep a tavern by herself, she again put on the dress of a man and enlisted as a soldier. But her military experience did not satisfy her, and after all she believed that she liked the sea better than the land, and again she shipped as a sailor on a vessel bound for the West Indies. Now Mary's desire for change and variety seemed likely to be fully satisfied. The ship was taken by English pirates, and as she was English and looked as if she would make a good freebooter, they compelled her to join them, and thus it was that she got her first idea of a pirate's life. When this company disbanded, she went to New Providence and enlisted on a privateer, but as was very common on such vessels commissioned to perform acts of legal piracy, the crew soon determined that illegal piracy was much preferable. So they hoisted the black flag and began to scourge the seas. Mary Reed was now a regular pirate, with a cutlass, pistol, and every outward appearance of a daring sea-robber, except that she wore no bristling beard, but as her face was sunburned and seamed by the weather, she looked mannish enough to frighten the senses out of any unfortunate trader on whose deck she bounded in company with her shouting, hairy-faced companions. It is told of her that she did not fancy the life of a pirate— but she seemed to believe in the principle of whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. She was as ready with her cutlass and her pistol as any other ocean bandit. But although Mary was a daring pirate, she was also a woman, and again she fell in love. A very pleasant and agreeable sailor was taken prisoner by the crew of her ship, and Mary concluded that she would take him as her portion of the spoils. Consequently, at the first port they touched, she became again a woman and married him, and as they had no other present method of livelihood, he remained with her on her ship. Mary and her husband had no real love for the pirate's life, and they determined to give it up as soon as possible, but the chance to do so did not arrive. Mary had a very high regard for her new husband, who was a quiet, amiable man, and not at all suited to his present life, and as he had become a pirate for the love of her, she did everything she could to make life easy for him. She even went so far as to fight a duel in his place, one of the crew having insulted him, probably thinking him a milksop who would not resent an affront. But the latent courage of Mary's husband instantly blazed up, and he challenged the insulter to a duel. Although Mary thought her husband was brave enough to fight anybody, she thought that perhaps in some ways he was a milksop, and did not understand the use of arms nearly as well as she did. Therefore she made him stay on board the ship, while she went to a little island near where they were anchored, and fought the duel with sword and pistol. The man-pirate and the woman-pirate now went savagely to work, and it was not long before the man-pirate lay dead upon the sand, while Mary returned to an admiring crew and a grateful husband. During her piratical career, Mary fell in with another woman pirate, Anne Bonny, by name, and these women, being perhaps the only two of their kind, became close friends. Anne came of a good family. She was the daughter of an Irish lawyer, who went to Carolina and became a planter. And there the little girl grew up. When her mother died, she kept the house, but her disposition was very much more masculine than feminine. She was very quick-tempered and easily enraged, and it is told of her that when an Englishwoman, who was working as a servant in her father's house, had irritated Anne by some carelessness or impertinence, that hot-tempered young woman sprang upon her and stabbed her with a carving knife. It is not surprising that Anne soon showed a dislike for the humdrum life on a plantation, and meeting with a young sailor, who owned nothing in the world but the becoming clothes he wore, she married him. Thereupon her father, who seems to have been as hot-headed as his daughter, promptly turned her out of doors. The fiery Anne was glad enough to adopt her husband's life, and she went to sea with him, sailing to New Providence. There she was thrown into an entirely new circle of society. Pirates were in the habit of congregating at this place, and Anne was greatly delighted with the company of these daring, dashing sea-robbers. 
of whose exploits she had so often heard. The more she associated with the pirates, the less she cared for the plain, stupid sailors, who were content with the merchant service, and she finally deserted her husband and married a Captain Rackham, one of the most attractive and dashing pirates of the day. Anne went on board the ship of her pirate husband, and as she was sure his profession would exactly suit her wild and impetuous nature, she determined also to become a pirate. She put on man's clothes, girded to her side a cutlass, and hung pistols in her belt. During many voyages Anne sailed with Captain Rackham, and wherever there was pirate's work to do, she was on deck to do it. At last the gallant captain came to grief. He was captured and condemned to death. Now there was an opportunity for Anne's nature to assert herself, and it did, but it was a very different sort of nature from that of Mary Reed. Just before his execution, Anne was admitted to see her husband, but instead of offering to do anything that might comfort him, or palliate his dreadful misfortune, she simply stood and contemptuously glared at him. She was sorry, she said, to see him in such a predicament, but she told him plainly that if he had had the courage to fight like a man, he would not then be waiting to be hung like a dog, and with that she walked away and left him. On the occasion when Captain Rackham had been captured, Mary Reed and her husband were on board his ship, and there was, perhaps, some reason for Anne's denunciation of the cowardice of Captain Rackham. As has been said, the two women were good friends and great fighters, and when they found the vessel engaged in a fight with a man of war, they stood together upon the deck and boldly fought, although the rest of the crew, and even the captain himself, were so discouraged by the heavy fire which was brought to bear on them that they had retreated to the hold. Mary and Anne were so disgusted by this exhibition of cowardice that they rushed to the hatchways and shouted to their dastardly companions to come up and help defend the ship, and when their entreaties were disregarded, they were so enraged that they fired down into the hold, killing one of the frightened pirates and wounding several others. But their ship was taken, and Mary and Anne, in company with all the pirates who had been left alive, were put in irons and carried to England. When she was in prison, Mary declared that she and her husband had firmly intended to give up piracy and become private citizens. But when she was put on trial, the accounts of her deeds had a great deal more effect than her words upon the judges, and she was condemned to be executed. She was saved, however, from this fate by a fever of which she died soon after her conviction. The impetuous Anne was also condemned, but the course of justice is often very curious and difficult to understand, and this hard-hearted and sanguinary woman was reprieved and finally pardoned. Whether or not she continued to disport herself as a man we do not know, but it is certain that she was the last of the female pirates. There are a great many things which women can do as well as men, and there are many professions and lines of work from which they have been long debarred, and for which they are most admirably adapted, but it seems to me that piracy is not one of them. It is said that a woman's nature is apt to carry her too far, and I have never heard of any man-pirate who would allow himself to become so enraged against the cowardice of his companions that he would deliberately fire down into the hold of a vessel containing his wife and a crowd of his former associates. End of chapter 28 Read by Gesine in September 2006
but it generally happens that these youthful ideas are never carried out, and that the boy who would wish to sell candy because he likes to eat it becomes a farmer on the western prairie, where confectionery is never seen, and the would-be general determines to study for the ministry. But Edward Lowe, the boy under consideration, was a different sort of a fellow. The life of a robber suited his youthful fancy, and he not only adopted it at a very early age, but he stuck to it until the end of his life. He was much stronger and bolder than the youngsters with whom he associated, and he soon became known among them as a regular land pirate. If a boy possessed anything which Ned Lowe desired, whether it happened to be an apple, a nut, or a farthing, the young robber gave chase to him, and treated him as a pirate treats a merchant vessel which he has boarded. Not only did young Lowe resemble a pirate in his dishonest methods, but he also resembled one in his meanness and cruelty. If one of his victims was supposed by him to have hidden any of the treasures which his captor believed him to possess, Lowe would inflict upon him every form of punishment which the ingenuity of a bad boy could devise, in order to compel him to confess where he concealed the half-penny which had been given to him for holding a horse, or the ball with which he had been seen playing. In the course of time this young street pirate became a terror to all boys in that part of London in which he lived, and by beginning so early he acquired a great proficiency in dishonest and cruel practices. It is likely that young Lowe inherited his knavish disposition, for one of his brothers became a very bold and ingenious thief, and invented a new kind of robbery which afterwards was popular in London. This brother grew to be a tall fellow, and it was his practice to dress himself like a porter, one of those men who in those days carried packages and parcels about the city. On his head he poised a basket, and supporting this burden with his hands, he hurriedly made his way through the most crowded streets of London. The basket was a heavy one, but it did not contain any ordinary goods, such as merchandise or marketing, but instead of these it held a very sharp and active boy, seven years old, one of the younger members of the Lowe family. As the tall brother pushed rapidly here and there among the hurrying people on the sidewalks, the boy in the basket would suddenly stretch out with his wiry young arm and snatch the hat or wig of some man who might pass near enough for him to reach him. This done, the porter and his basket would quickly be lost in the crowd, and even if the astonished citizen, suddenly finding himself hatless and wigless, beheld the long-legged low, he would have no reason to suppose that that industrious man with the basket on his head had anything to do with the loss of his head covering. This new style of street robbery must have been quite profitable, for of course the boy in the basket was well instructed, and never snatched at a shabby hat or a poor-looking wig. The elder Lowe came to have a good many imitators, and it happened in the course of time that many a worthy citizen of London wished there was some harmless way of gluing his wig to the top of his head, or that it were the custom to secure the hat by means of strings tied under the chin. As Ned Lowe grew up to be a strong young fellow, he also grew discontented with the pilferings and petty plunders which were possible to him in the London streets, and so he went to sea and sailed to America. He landed in Boston, and, as it was necessary to work in order to eat, for opportunities of a dishonest livelihood had not yet opened themselves before him, he undertook to learn the trade of a rigger, but, as he was very badly suited to any sort of steady occupation, he soon quarrelled with his master, ran away, and got on board a vessel bound for Honduras. For a time he earned a livelihood by cutting logwood, but it was not long before he quarrelled with the captain of the vessel for whom he was working and finally became so enraged that he tried to kill him. He did not succeed in this dastardly attempt, but as he could not commit murder, he decided to do the next worst thing. And so, gathering together twelve of the greatest rascals among his companions, they seized a boat, went out to the captain's schooner, which was lying near shore, and took possession of it. Then they hoisted anchor, ran up the sail, and put out to sea, leaving the captain and the men who were with him to take care of themselves the best that they could, and live on logwood leaves if they could find nothing else to eat. Now young Lowe was out upon the ocean, in possession of a vessel, and in command of twelve sturdy scoundrels, and he did not have the least trouble in the world in making up his mind what he should do next. As soon as he could manufacture a black flag for materials he found on board, he flung this ominous ensign to the breeze, and declared himself a pirate. This was the summit of his ambition, and in this new profession he had very little to learn 
From a boy thief to a man pirate, the way is easy enough. The logwood schooner, of course, was not provided with the cannon, cutlasses, and pistols necessary for piratical undertakings, and therefore Lowe found himself in the position of a young man beginning business with a very small capital. So, in the hopes of providing himself with the necessary appliances for his work, Lowe sailed for one of the islands of the West Indies, which was a resort for pirates, and there he had very good fortune, for he fell in with a man named Lowther, who was already well established in the profession of piracy. When Lowe sailed into the little port with his home-made black flag floating above him, Lowther received him with the greatest courtesy and hospitality, and shortly afterwards proposed to the newly-fledged pirate to go into partnership with him. This offer was accepted, and Lowe was made second-in-command of the little fleet of two vessels, each of which was well provided with arms, ammunition, and all things necessary for robbery on the high seas. The partnership between these two rascals did not continue very long. They took several valuable prizes, and the more booty he obtained, the higher became Lowe's opinion of himself, and the greater his desire for independent action. Therefore, it was that when they had captured a large brigantine, Lowe determined that he would no longer serve under any man. He made a bargain with Lowther, by which they dissolved partnership, and Lowe became the owner of the brigantine. In this vessel, with forty-four men as crew, he again started out in the black flag business on his own account, and parting from his former chief officer, he sailed northward. As Lowe had landed in Boston, and had lived some time in that city, he seems to have conceived a fancy for New England, which, however, was not at all reciprocated by the inhabitants of that part of the country. Among the first feats which Lowe performed in New England waters was the capture of a sloop about to enter one of the ports of Rhode Island. When he had taken everything out of this vessel which he wanted, Lowe cut away the yards from the masts and stripped the vessel of all its sails and rigging. As his object was to get away from these waters before his presence was discovered by the people on shore, he not only made it almost impossible to sail the vessel he had despoiled, but he wounded the captain and others of the peaceful crew, so that they should not be able to give information to any passing craft. Then he sailed away as rapidly as possible in the direction of the open sea. In spite, however, of all the disadvantages under which they labored, the crew of the merchant vessel managed to get into Block Island, and from there a small boat was hurriedly rowed over to Rhode Island, carrying intelligence of the bold piracy which had been committed so close to one of its ports. When the governor heard what had happened, he quickly sent out drummers to sound the alarm in the seaport towns, and to call upon volunteers to go out and capture the pirates. So great was the resentment caused by the audacious deed of Lowe, that a large number of volunteers hastened to offer their services to the governor, and two vessels were fitted out with such rapidity that although their commanders had only heard of the affair in the morning, they were ready to sail before sunset. They put on all sail and made the best speed they could, and although they really caught sight of Lowe's ship, the pirate vessel was a swifter craft than those in pursuit of her, and the angry sailors of Rhode Island were at last compelled to give up the chase. The next of Lowe's transactions was on a wholesale scale. Rounding Cape Cod and sailing up the coast, he at last reached the vicinity of Marblehead, and there, in a harbor called in those days Port Rosemary, he found at anchor a fleet of thirteen merchant vessels. This was a grand sight, as welcome to the eye of a pirate as a great nugget of gold would be to a miner who for weary days had been washing yellow grains from the pay-dirt which he had laboriously dug from the hard soil. It would have been easy for Lowe to take his pick from these vessels, quietly resting in the little harbour, for he soon perceived that none of them were armed, nor were they able to protect themselves from assault, but his audacity was of an expansive kind, and he determined to capture them all. Sailing boldly into the harbour, he hoisted the dreadful black flag, and then, standing on his quarter-deck with his speaking-trumpet, he shouted to each vessel as he passed it, that if it did not surrender, he would board it and give no quarter to captain or crew. Of course there was nothing else for the peaceful sailors to do but to submit, and so this greedy pirate took possession of each vessel in turn, and stripped it of everything of value he cared to take away. But he did not confine himself to stealing the goods on board these merchantmen. As he preferred to command several vessels instead of one, he took possession of some of the best of the ships, and compelled as many of their men as he thought he would need to enter his service. Then, as one of the captured vessels was larger and better than his brigantine, 
he took it for his own ship. And at the head of the little pirate fleet he did farewell to Marblehead, and started out on a grand cruise against the commerce of our coast. It is wonderful how rapidly this man Lowe succeeded in his business enterprises. Beginning with a little vessel, with a dozen unarmed men, he found himself in a very short time at the head of what was perhaps the largest piratical force in American waters. What might have happened if nature had not taken a hand in this game, it is not difficult to imagine, for our seaboard towns, especially those of the south, would have been an easy prey to Lowe and his fleet. But sailing down to the West Indies, probably in order to fit out his ships with guns, arms, and ammunition, before beginning a naval campaign, his fleet was overtaken by a terrible storm, and in order to save the vessels, they were obliged to throw overboard a great many of the heavier goods they had captured at Marblehead. And when at last they found shelter in the harbor of a small island, they were glad that they had escaped with their lives. The grasping and rapacious Lowe was not now in a condition to proceed to any rendezvous of pirates, where he might purchase the arms and supplies he needed. A great part of his valuable plunder had gone to the bottom of the sea, and he was therefore obliged to content himself with operations upon a comparatively small scale. How small and contemptible this scale was, it is scarcely possible for an ordinary civilized being to comprehend, but the soul of this ignoble pirate was capable of extraordinary baseness. When he had repaired the damage to his ships, Low sailed out from the island, and before long he fell in with a wrecked vessel which had lost all its masts in a great storm, and was totally disabled, floating about wherever the winds chose to blow it. The poor fellows on board greatly needed succor, and there is no doubt that when they saw the approach of sails their hopes rose high, and even if they had known what sort of ships they were which were making their way toward them, they would scarcely have suspected that the commander of these goodly vessels was such an utterly despicable scoundrel as he proved to be. Instead of giving any sort of aid to the poor shipwrecked crew, Lowe and his men set to work to plunder their vessel, and they took from it a thousand pounds in money, and everything of value which they could find on board. Having thus stripped the unfortunate wreck, they departed, leaving the captain and crew of the disabled vessel to perish by storm or starvation, unless some other vessel, manned by human beings and not pitiless beasts, should pass their way and save them. Low now commenced a long series of piratical depredations. He captured many merchantmen, he committed the vilest cruelties upon his victims, and in every way proved himself to be one of the meanest and most black-hearted pirates of whom we have any account. It is not necessary to relate his various dastardly performances. They were all very much of the same order, and none of them possessed any peculiar interest. His existence is referred to in these pages because he was one of the most noted and successful pirates of his time, and also because his career indicated how entirely different was the character of the buccaneers of previous days from that of the pirates who in the eighteenth century infested our coast. The first might have been compared to bold and dashing highwaymen, who at least showed courage and daring, but the others resembled sneak thieves, always seeking to commit a crime if they could do it in safety, but never willing to risk their cowardly necks in any danger. The buccaneers of the olden days were certainly men of the greatest bravery. They did not hesitate to attack well-armed vessels manned by crews much larger than their own, and in later periods they faced cannon and conquered cities. Their crimes were many and vile, but when they committed cruelties they did so in order to compel their prisoners to disclose their hidden treasures, and when they attacked a Spanish vessel and murdered all on board, they had in their hearts the remembrance that the Spanish naval forces gave no quarter to buccaneers. But pirates, such as Edward Lowe, showed not one palliating feature in their infamous characters. To rob and desert a shipwrecked crew was only one of Lowe's contemptible actions. It appears that he seldom attacked a vessel from which there seemed to be any probability of resistance, and we read of no notable combats or sea-fights in which he was engaged. He preyed upon the weak and defenseless, and his inhuman cruelties were practiced not for the sake of extorting gain from his victims, but simply to gratify his spite and love of wickedness. There were men among Lowe's followers who looked upon him as a bold and brave leader, for he was always a blusterer and a braggart, and there were honest seamen and merchants who were very much afraid of him, but time proved that there was no reason for any one to suppose that Edward Lowe had a spark of courage in his composition. He was brave enough when he was attacking an unarmed crew, 
but when he had to deal with any vessel capable of inflicting any injury upon him, he was a coward indeed. Sailing in company with one companion vessel, for he had discarded the greater part of his pirate fleet, Lowe sighted a good-sized ship at a considerable distance, and he and his consort immediately gave chase, supposing the distant vessel might prove to be a good prize. It so happened, however, that the ship discovered by Lowe was an English man-of-war, the Greyhound, which was cruising along the coast looking for these very pirates, who had recently committed some outrageous crimes upon the crews of merchant vessels in those waters. When the two ships, with the black flags floating above them, and their decks crowded with desperate fellows, armed with pistols and cutlasses, drew near to the vessel, of which they expected to make a prize, they were greatly amazed when she suddenly turned in her course, and delivered a broadside from her heavy cannon. The pirates returned the fire, for they were well armed with cannon, and there's nothing else for them to do but fight. But the combat was an extremely short one. Lowe's consort was soon disabled by the fire from the man of war, and, as soon as he perceived this, the dastardly low, without any regard for his companions in arms, and with no thought for anything but his own safety, immediately stopped fighting, and setting all sail, sped away from the scene of combat as swiftly as it was possible for the wind to force his vessel through the water. The disabled pirate ship was quickly captured, and not long afterwards twenty-five of her crew were tried, convicted, and hung near Newport, Rhode Island but the errant Lowe escaped without injury, and continued his career of contemptible crime for some time longer. What finally became of him is not set down in the histories of piracy. It is not improbable that if the men under his command were not too brutally stupid to comprehend his cowardly unfaithfulness to them, they suddenly removed from this world one of the least interesting of all base beings. End of chapter 29 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. Buccaneers and Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton. Chapter 30 The Pirate of the Gulf. At the beginning of this century, there was a very able and indeed talented man, living on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, who has been set down in the historical records of the times as a very important pirate, and who is described in story and in tradition as a gallant and romantic freebooter of the sea. This man was Jean Lafitte, widely known as the Pirate of the Gulf, and yet who was, in fact, so little of a pirate, that it may be doubted whether or not he deserves a place in these stories of American pirates. Lafitte was a French blacksmith, and, while still a young man, he came with his two brothers to New Orleans, and set up a shop in Bourbon Street, where he did a good business in horseshoeing and in other branches of his trade. But he had a soul which soared high above his anvil and his bellows, and perceiving an opportunity to take up a very profitable occupation, he gave up blacksmithing, and with his two brothers as partners, became a superintendent of privateering, and a general manager of semi-legalized piracy. The business opportunity, which came to the watchful and clear-sighted Lafitte, may be briefly described. In the early years of the century, the Gulf of Mexico was the scene of operations of small vessels calling themselves privateers, but in fact pirates. War had broken out, between England and Spain on the one side, and France on the other, and consequently the first-named nations were very glad to commission privateers to prey upon the commerce of France. There were also privateers who had been sent out by some of the Central American republics, who had thrown off the Spanish yoke, and these, considering Spanish vessels as their proper booty, were very much inclined to look upon English vessels in the same light, as the English and Spanish were allies and when a few French privateers came also upon the scene, they helped make the business of legitimate capture of merchantmen, during the time of war, a very complicated affair. But upon one point these privateers, who so often acted as pirates, 
because they had not the spare time in which to work out difficult problems of nationality, were all agreed. When they had loaded their ships with booty, they must sail to some place where it would be safe to dispose of it. So, in course of time, the Bay of Barataria, about forty miles south of New Orleans, and very well situated for an illegal settlement, was chosen as a privateer's port, and a large and flourishing colony soon grew up at the head of the bay, to which came privateers of every nationality to dispose of their cargoes. Of course, there was no one in the comparatively desolate country, around Barataria, who could buy the valuable goods which were bought into that port, but the great object of the owners of this merchandise was to smuggle it up to New Orleans and dispose of it. But there could be no legitimate traffic of this sort, for the United States, at the very beginning of the century, was at peace with England, France, and Spain, and therefore could not receive into any of her ports goods which had been captured from the ships of these nations. Consequently, the plunder of the privateering pirates of Barataria was brought up to New Orleans in all sorts of secret and underhand fashions, and sold to merchants in that city, without the custom-house having anything to do with the importations. Now this was great business. Jean Lafitte had a great business mind, and therefore it was not long after his arrival at Barataria before he was the head man in the colony, and director-in-chief of all its operations. Thus, by becoming a prominent figure in a piratical circle, he came to be considered a pirate, and as such came down to us in the pages of history. But in fact Lafitte never committed an act of piracy in his life. He was a blacksmith, and knew no more about sailing a ship, or even the smallest kind of boat, than he knew about the proper construction of a sonnet. He did not even try, like the celebrated bonnet, to find other people who would navigate a vessel for him, for he had no taste for the ocean wave, and all that he had to do he did upon firm dry land. It was said of him that he was never at sea but twice in his life, once when he came from France, and once when he left this country, and on neither occasion did he sail under the Jolly Roger, as the pirate flag was sometimes called. For these reasons it seems scarcely right to call Lafitte a pirate, but as he has been so generally considered in that light, we will omit him into the bad company, the stories of whose lives we are now telling. The energy and business abilities of Jean Lafitte soon made themselves felt not only in Barataria, but in New Orleans. The pirates found that he managed their affairs with much discretion and considerable fairness, and, while they were willing to depend on him, they were obliged to obey him. On the other hand, the trade of New Orleans was very much influenced by the great quantities of goods, which under Lafitte's directions were smuggled into the city. Many merchants and shopkeepers, who possessed no consciences to speak of, were glad to buy these smuggled goods for very little money, and to sell them at low prices and large profits. But the respectable businessmen, who were obliged to pay market prices for their goods, were greatly disturbed by the large quantities of merchandise which were continually smuggled into New Orleans, and sold at rates with which they could not compete. It was towards the end of our war with England, which began in 1812, that the government of the United States, urged to speedy action by the increasing complaints of the law-abiding merchants of New Orleans, determined to send out a small naval force and entirely break up the illegitimate rendezvous at Barataria. Lafitte's two brothers were in New Orleans acting as his agents, and one of them, Dominique, was arrested and thrown into prison, and Commodore Patterson, who was commanding at that station, was ordered to fit out an expedition as quickly as possible to sail down to Barataria to destroy the ships found in the bay, to capture the town, and to confiscate and seize upon all goods which might be found in the place. When Jean Lafitte heard of the vigorous methods which were about to be taken against him, his prospects must have been very gloomy ones, for of course he could not defend his little colony against a regular naval force, which, although its large vessels could not sail into the shallow bay, could send out boats with armed crews, against which it would be foolish for him to contend. But just about this time a very strange thing happened. A strong English naval force had taken possession of Pensacola, Florida. And as an attack on New Orleans was contemplated, the British commander, knowing of Lafitte's colony at Barataria, and believing that these hardy and reckless adventurers would be very valuable allies in the proposed movement upon the city, 
determined to send an ambassador to Tilafit to see what could be done in the way of forming an alliance with this powerful leader of semi pirates and smugglers. Accordingly, the sloop of war Sophia, commanded by Captain Lockyer, was sent to Barataria to treat with Lafitte, and when this vessel arrived off the mouth of the harbour, which she could not enter, she began firing signal guns in order to attract the attention of the people of the colony. Naturally enough, the report of the Sophia's guns created a great excitement in Barataria, and all the people who happened to be at the settlement at that time crowded out upon the beach to see what they could see. But the war vessel was too far away for them to distinguish her nationality, and Lafitte quickly made up his mind that the only thing for him to do was to row out to the mouth of the harbour and to see what was the matter. Without doubt he feared that this was the United States vessel which had come to break up his settlement, but whether this was the case or not, he must go out and try the effect of fair words, for he had no desire whatever to defend his interests by hard blows. Before Lafitte reached the vessel, he was surprised to find that it was a British man of war, not an American, and very soon he saw that a boat was coming from it, and rowing towards him. This boat contained Captain Lockyer and two other officers, besides the men who rowed it. When the two boats met, the captain told who he was, and asked if Mr. Lafitte could be found in Barataria, stating that he had an important document to deliver to him. The cautious Frenchman did not immediately admit that he was the man for whom the document was intended, but he said that Lafitte was at Barataria, and as the two boats rowed together toward shore, he thought it would be as well to announce his position, and did so. When the crowd of privateersmen saw the officers in British uniform landing upon their beach, they were not inclined to receive them kindly, for an attack had been made upon the place by a small British force some time before, and a good deal of damage had been done. But Lafitte quieted the angry feelings of his followers, conducted the officers to his own house, and treated them with great hospitality, which he was able to do in fine style, for his men brought into Barataria luxuries from all parts of the world. When Lafitte opened the package of papers which Captain Lockyer handed him, he was very much surprised. Some of them were general proclamations, announcing the intention of Great Britain, if the people of Louisiana did not submit to her demands. But the most important document was one in which Colonel Nichols, commander-in-chief of the British forces in the Gulf, made an offer to Lafitte and his followers to become a part of the British Navy, promising to give amnesty to all the inhabitants of Barataria, to make their leader a captain in the Navy, and to do a great many other good things, provided they would join his forces and help him to attack the American seaports. In case, however, this offer should be refused, the Baratarians were assured that their place would speedily be attacked, their vessels destroyed, and all their possessions confiscated. Lafitte was now in a state of great perplexity. He did not wish to become a British captain, for his knowledge of horseshoeing would be of no service to him in such a capacity. Moreover, he had no love for the British, and his sympathies were all on the side of the United States in this war. But here he was with the British commander, asking him to become an ally, and to take up arms against the United States, threatening at the same time to destroy him and his colony in case of refusal. On the other hand, there was the United States, at that moment preparing an expedition for the purpose of breaking up the settlement of Barataria, and to do everything which the British threatened to do, in case Lafitte did not agree to their proposals. The chief of Barataria might have made a poor show with a cutlass and a brace of pistols, but he was a long-headed and sagacious man, with a strong tendency to practical diplomacy. He was in a bad scrape, and he must act with decision and promptness if he wanted to get out of it. The first thing he did was to gain time by delaying his answer to the proposition brought by Captain Lockyer. He assured that officer that he must consult with his people, and see what they would do and that he must also get rid of some truculent members of the colony who would never agree to act in concert with England, and that therefore he should not be able to give an answer to Colonel Nichols for two weeks. Captain Lockyer saw for himself that it would not be an easy matter to induce these independent and unruly fellows, many of whom already hated England, to enter into the British service. Therefore he thought it would be wise to allow Lafitte the time he asked for, and he sailed away, promising to return in fifteen days. The diplomatic Lafitte, having finished for a time his negotiations with the British, lost no time in communicating with the American authorities. 
he sent to Governor Claiborne of Louisiana all the documents he had received from Captain Lockyer, and wrote him a letter in which he told him everything that had happened, and thus gave to the United States the first authentic information of the proposed attack on Mobile and New Orleans. He then told the Governor that he had no intention of fighting against the country he had adopted, that he was perfectly willing and anxious to aid her in every manner possible, and that he and his followers would gladly join the United States against the British, asking nothing in return, except that all proceedings against Barataria should be abandoned, that amnesty should be given to him and his men, that his brother should be released from prison, and that an act of oblivion should be passed, by which the deeds of the smugglers of Barataria should be condoned and forgotten. Furthermore, he said that if the United States government did not accede to his proposition, he would immediately depart from Barataria with all his men, for no matter what loss such a proceeding might prove to him, he would not remain in a place where he might be forced to act against the United States. Lafitte also wrote to a member of the Louisiana legislature, and his letters were well calculated to produce a very good effect in his favour. The governor immediately called a council and submitted the papers and letters received from Lafitte. When these had been read, two points were considered by the council, the first being that the letters and proclamations from the British might be forgeries, concocted by Lafitte, for the purpose of averting the punishment which was threatened by the United States, and the second, whether or not it would be consistent with the dignity of the government to treat with this leader of pirates and smugglers. The consultation resulted in a decision not to have anything to do with Lafitte in the way of negotiations, and to hurry forward the preparations which had been made for the destruction of the dangerous and injurious settlement at Barataria. In consequence of this action of the Council, Commodore Patterson sailed in a very few days down the Mississippi, and attacked the pirate settlement at Barataria, with such effect that most of her ships were taken, many prisoners and much valuable merchandise captured, and the whole place utterly destroyed. Lafitte, with the greater part of his men, had fled to the woods, and so escaped capture. Captain Lockyer, at the appointed time, arrived off the harbour of Barataria, and blazed away with his signal-guns for forty-eight hours, but receiving no answer, and fearing to send a boat into the harbour, suspecting treachery on the part of Lafitte, he was obliged to depart in ignorance of what had happened. When the papers and letters, which had been sent to Governor Claiborne by Lafitte, were made public, the people of Louisiana and the rest of the country did not at all agree with the Governor and his Council in regard to their decision and their subsequent action, and Edward Livingston, a distinguished lawyer of New York, took the part of Lafitte, and argued very strongly in favour of his loyalty and honesty in the affair. Even when it was discovered that all the information which Lafitte had sent was perfectly correct, and that a formidable attack was about to be made on New Orleans, General Jackson, who was in command of that part of the country, issued a very savage proclamation against the British method of making war, and among their wicked deeds he mentioned nothing which seemed to him to be worse than their endeavour to employ against the citizens of the United States the band of hellish banditti commanded by Jean Lafitte. But public opinion was strongly in favour of the ex-pirate of the Gulf and as things began to look more and more serious in regard to New Orleans, General Jackson was at last very glad, in spite of all that he had said, to accept the renewed offers of Lafitte and his men to assist in the defence of the city, and in consequence of his change of mind, many of the former inhabitants of Barataria fought in the Battle of New Orleans, and did good work. Their services were so valuable, in fact, that when the war closed, President Madison issued a proclamation in which it was stated that the former inhabitants of Barataria, in consequence of having abandoned their wicked ways of life, and having assisted in the defence of their country, were now granted full pardon for all the evil deeds they had previously committed. Now Lafitte and his men were free and independent citizens of the United States. They could live where they pleased without fear of molestation, and could enter into any sort of legal business which suited their fancy. But this did not satisfy Lafitte. He had endeavoured to take a prompt and honest stand on the side of his country. His offers had been treated with contempt and disbelief. He had been branded as a deceitful knave, and no disposition had been shown to act justly toward him, until his services became so necessary to the government that it was obliged to accept them. Consequently, 
Lafitte, accompanied by some of his old adherents, determined to leave a country where his loyalty had received such unsatisfactory recognition, and to begin life again in some other part of the American continent. Not long after the war he sailed out upon the Gulf of Mexico, for what destination it is not known, but probably for some Central American port. And as nothing was ever heard of him or his party, it is believed by many persons that they all perished in the great storm which arose soon after their departure. There were other persons, however, who stated that he reached Uticon, where he died on dry land in 1826. But the end of Lafitte is no more doubtful than his right to the title given to him by people of a romantic turn of mind, and other persons of a still more fanciful disposition might be willing to suppose that the Gulf of Mexico, indignant at the undeserved distinction which had come to him, had swallowed him up in order to put an end to his pretension to the title of the Pirate of the Gulf. End of chapter 30「ジャンプ・ロマンス」「ジャンプ・ロマンス。All other pirates who made themselves notorious on our coast were known as robbers, pillagers, and ruthless destroyers of life and property, but Captain Kidd's fame was of another kind. We do not think of him as a pirate who came to carry away the property of American citizens, for nearly all the stories about him relate to his arrival at different points on our shores, for the sole purpose of burying and thus concealing the rich treasures which he had collected in other parts of the world. This novel reputation given a pirate who enriched our shore by his deposits and took away none of the possessions of our people could not fail to make Captain Kidd a most interesting personage, and the result has been that he has been lifted out of the sphere of ordinary history and, and description into the region of imagination and legendary romance. In a word, he has been made a hero of fiction and song. It may be well, then, to assume that there are two Captain Kidds, one the Kid of legend and story, and the other the Kid of actual fact. And we will consider one at a time the two characters in which we know the man. As has been said before, nearly all the stories of the legendary Captain Kidd relate to his visits along our northern coast, and even to the inland points, for the purpose of concealing the treasures which had been amassed in other parts of the world. Thus, if we were to find ourselves in almost any village or rural settlement along the coast of New Jersey or Long Island, and were to fall in with any old resident who was fond of talking to strangers, he would probably point out to us that the blackened and weather beaten ribs of a great ship which had been wrecked on the sandbar off the coast during a terrible storm long ago. He would show us where the bathing was pleasant and safe. He would tell us of the best place for fishing, and probably show us the high bluff, a little Back from the beach, from which the Indian maiden leaped to escape the tomahawk of her enraged lover. And then he would be almost sure to tell us of the secluded spot where it was said Captain Kidd and his pirates once buried a lot of treasure. If we should ask our garrulous guide why this treasure had not been dug up by the people of the place, he would probably shake his head and declare that personally he knew nothing about it. But that it was generally believed that it was there, and he had heard that there had been people who had tried to find it. But if they did find any, they never said anything about it, and it was his opinion that if Captain Kidd ever put any gold or silver or precious stones under the ground on that part of the coast, these treasures were all there yet. Further questioning would probably develop the fact that there was a certain superstition which prevented a great many people from interfering with the possible deposits which Captain Kidd had made in their neighborhood. And although few persons would be able to define exactly the foundation of the superstition, it was generally supposed that most of the pirates' treasures were guarded by pirate ghosts. 
In that case, of course, timid individuals would be deterred from going out by themselves at night, for that was the proper time to dig for buried treasure, and as it would not have been easy to get together a number of men each brave enough to give the others courage, many of the spots reputed to be the rep repositories of buried treasure have never been disturbed. In spite of the fear of ghosts, in spite of the want of accurate knowledge in regard to favored localities, in spite of hardships, previous disappointments, or expected ridicule, a great many extensive excavations have been made in the sands or the soil along the coasts of our northern states, and even in quiet woods lying miles from the sea, to which it would have been necessary for the pirates to carry their goods in wagons, people have dug and hoped, and have gone away sadly to attend to more sensible business and far up some of our rivers, where a pirate vessel never floated, people have dug with the same hopeful anxiety, and have stopped digging in the same condition of dejected disappointment. Sometimes these enterprises were conducted on a scale which reminds us of the operation on the Gold Coast of California. Companies were organized, stock was issued and subscribed for, and the excavations were conducted under the direction of skillful treasure-seeking engineers. It is said that not long ago a company was organized in Nova Scotia for the purpose of seeking the Captain Kidd's treasure in a place which is, it is highly probable Captain Kidd never saw. A great excavation having been made, the water from the sea came in and filled it up, but the work was stopped only long enough to procure steam pumps with which the big hole could be drained. At last accounts the treasure had not been reached, and this incident is mentioned only to show how this belief in buried treasure continues even to the present day. There is a legend which differs somewhat from the ordinary run of these stories, and it is told about a little island on the coast of Cape Cod which is called Hannah Screecher's Island, and this is the way its name came to it. Captain Kidd, while sailing along the coast looking for a suitable place to bury some treasure, found this island adapted to his purpose, and landed there with his savage crew and his bags and boxes and his gold and precious stones. It was said to be the habit of these pirates, whenever they made a deposit on the coast, to make the hole big enough not only to hold the treasure they wished to deposit there, but the body of one of the crew, who was buried with the valuables, in order that his spirit might act as a day and night watchman to frighten away people who might happen to be digging in that particular spot. The story relates that somewhere on the coast Captain Kidd had captured a young lady named Hannah, and not knowing what to do with her, and desiring not to commit an unnecessary extravagance by deposit disposing of a useful sailor, he determined to kill Hannah and bury her with the treasure, in order that she might keep away intruders until he came for it. It was very natural that when Hannah was brought on shore and found out what was going to be done with her, she should screech in a most dreadful manner, and although the pirates soon silenced her and covered her up, they did not succeed in silencing her spirit, and ever since that time, according to the stories told by some of the older inhabitants of Cape Cod, there may be heard in the early dusk of the evening the screeches of Hannah coming across the water from her little island to the mainland. Mr. James Herbert Morris has written a ballad founded upon this peculiar incident, and with the permission of the author, we give it here. The Lady Hannah Now take my hand, quoth Captain Kidd, the air is blithe, I sent the meads. He led her up the starlit sands, out of the rustling reeds. The great white owl then beat his breast, athwart the cedar word and flew. There's death in our handsome captain's eyes, murmured the pirate's crew. And long they lay upon their oars, and cursed the silence and the chill. They cursed the wail of the rising wind, for no man dared be still. Of ribald songs they sang a score, to stifle the midnight sobs and sighs. They told wild tales of the Indian main, to drown the far-off cries. But when they ceased, and Captain Kidd came down the sands of Dead Neck Isle, My lady wearies, he grimly said, and we should rest a while. I've made her a bed, tis here, tis here, and she shall wake, be it soon or long, where grass is green and wild birds sing, and the wind makes under song. Be quick, my men, and give a hand, she loved soft furs and silken stuff, jewels of gold and silver bars, and she shall have enough. With silver bars and golden ore, so fine a lady she shall be, a many suitors shall seek her long, as they sought Penelope. And if a lover would win her hand, no lips e'er kissed a hand so white, and if a lover would hear her sing, she sings at owlet and light. But if a lover would win her gold, and his hands be strong to lift the lid, tis here, tis there, tis everywhere, in the chest, quoth Captain Kidd. 
they lifted long they lifted well ingots of gold and silver bars and silken plunder from wild wild wars but where they laid them no man can tell though none to a thousand stars but the ordinary kid stories are very much the same and depend a good deal upon the character of the coast and upon the imagination of the people who live in that region we will give one of them as a sample and from this a number of very good pirate stories could be manufactured by ingenious persons it was a fine summer night late in the seventeenth century a young man named abner stout in company with his wife mary went out for a walk upon the beach they lived in a little village near the coast of new jersey abner was a good carpenter but a poor man but he and his wife were very happy with each other and as they walked towards the sea in the light of the full moon no young lovers could have been more gay when they reached a little bluff covered with low shrubbery which was the first spot from which they could have a full view of the ocean abner suddenly stopped and pointed out to mary an unusual sight there as plainly in view as if it had been broad daylight was a vessel lying at the entrance of the little bay the sails were furled and it was apparently anchored for a minute abner gazed in utter amazement at the sight of this vessel for no ships large or small came to this little lonely bay there was a harbor two or three miles farther up the co coast to which all trading craft repaired what could the strange ship want here this unusual visitor to the little bay was a very low and very long black schooner with tall masts which raked forward and with something which looked very much like a black flag fluttering in its rigging now the truth struck into the soul of abner hide yourself mary he whispered it is a pirate ship and almost at the same instant the young man and his wife laid themselves flat on the ground among the bushes but they were very careful each of them to take a position which would allow them to peep out through the twigs and leaves upon the scene before them there seemed to be a good deal of commotion on board the black schooner and very soon a large boat pushed off from her side and the men in it began rowing rapidly towards the shore apparently making for a spot on the beach not far from the bluff on which abner and mary were concealed let us get up and run whispered mary trembling from head to toe they are pirates and they are coming here lie still lie still said abner if we get up and leave these bushes we shall be seen and then they will be after us lie still and do not move a finger the trembling mary obeyed her husband and they both lay quite still scarcely breathing with eyes wide open the boat rapidly approached the shore abner counted ten men rowing and one man sitting in the stern the boat seemed to be heavily loaded and the oarsmen rowed hard now the boat was run through the surf to the beach and its eleven occupants jumped out there was no mistaking their character they were true pirates they had great cutlasses and pistols and one of them was very tall and broad-shouldered and wore an old-fashioned cocked hat that's captain kidd whispered abner to his wife and she pressed his hand to let him know that she thought he must be right now the men came up high upon the beach and began looking about here and there as if they were searching for something mary was filled with horror for fear they should come to the to that bluff to search but abner knew there was no danger of that they had probably come to those shores to bury treasure as if they were great sea turtles coming up upon the beach to lay their eggs and they were now looking for some good spot where they might dig presently the tall man gave some orders in a low voice and then his men left him to himself and went back to the boat there is a great pine tree standing back a considerable distance from the water battered and racked by storms but still a tough old tree towards this the pirate captain stalked and standing close to it with his back against it he looked up into the sky it was plain that he was looking for a star there were very few of these luminaries to be seen in the heavens for the moon was so bright but as abner looked in the direction in which the pirate captain gazed he saw a star still bright in spite of the moonlight with his eyes fixed upon the star the pirate captain now stepped forward making long strides one two three four five six seven then he stopped plunged his right heel in the soft ground and turned squarely about to the left so that his broad back was now parallel with the line drawn from the pine tree to the star at right angles to this line the pirate now stepped forward making as before seven long paces then he stopped dug his heel into the ground and beckoned to his men up they came running carrying picks and spades and with great alacrity they began to dig at the place where the captain had marked with his heel it was plain that these pirates were used to making excavations for it was not long before the hole was so deep that those within it could not be seen then the captain gave an order to cease digging and he and all the pirates went back to the boat 
For about half an hour, though Mary thought it was a longer time than that, those pirates worked very hard carrying great boxes and bags from the boat to the excavation. When everything had been brought up, two of the pirates went down into the hole, and the other handed to them the various packages. Skillfully and quickly they worked, doubtless storing their goods with great care, until, until nearly everything which had been brought from the boat had been placed in the deep hole. Some rolls of good were left upon the ground which Mary thought were carpets, but which Abner believed to be the rich Persian rugs or something of that kind. Now the captain stepped aside, and picking up from the sand some little sticks and reeds, he selected ten of them and with these in one hand, and with their ends protruding a short distance above his closed fingers, he rejoined his men. They gathered before him, and he held out towards them the hand which contained the little sticks. "'They're drawing lots!' gasped Abner, and Mary trembled more than she had done yet. Now the lots were all drawn, and one man, apparently a young pirate, stepped out from among his fellows. His head was bowed, and his arms were folded across his manly chest. The captain spoke a few words, and the young pirate advanced alone to the side of the deep hole. Mary now shut her eyes tight, tight, but Abner's eyes were wide open. There was a sudden gleam of cutlasses in the air. There was one short plaintive groan, and the body of the young pirate fell into the hole. Instantly all the other goods, furs, rugs, or whatever they were, were tumbled in upon him. Then the men began to shovel in the earth and sand, and an inc and in an incredibly short time the hole was filled up, even with the ground about it. Of course all the earth and sand which had been taken out of the hole could, now, could not now be put back in, but these experienced treasure-hiders knew exactly what to do with it. A spadeful at a time, the soil which could not be replaced was carried to the sea, and thrown out into the water, and when the whole place had been carefully smoothed over, the pirates gathered sticks and stones, and little bushes and great masses of wild cranberry vines, and scattered them about over the place, so that it soon looked exactly like the rest of the beach about it. Then the tall captain gave another low command, the pirates returned to their boat, it was pushed off, and rapidly rowed back to the schooner. Up came the anchor, up went the dark sails, the low black schooner was put about, and very soon she was disappearing over, over the darkening waters, her black flag fluttering fiercely high above her. "'Now let us run,' whispered poor Mary, who, although she had not seen everything, imagined a great deal, for as the pirates were getting into their boat she had opened her eyes and had counted them, and there were only nine besides the tall captain. Abner thought that her advice was very good, and starting up out of the brushwood they hastened home as fast as their legs would carry them. The next day Abner seemed to be a changed man. He had work to do, but he neglected it. Never had such a thing happened before. For hours he sat in front of the house, looking up into the sky, counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then he would twist himself around on the little bench and count seven more. This worthy couple lived in a small house which had a large cellar, and during the afternoon of that day Abner busied himself in clearing out the cellar, and taking out of it everything which he, it had contained. His wife asked no questions. In her soul she knew what Abner was thinking about. Supper was over, and most of the people in the village were thinking of going to bed, when Abner said to Mary, "'Let us each take a spade, and I will carry a pail, and we will go out upon the beach for a walk. If any one should see us, they would think that we were going to dig for clams.' "'Oh, no, dear Abner!' cried Mary. "'We must not go dig there. Think of that young pirate. Almost the first thing we would come to would be him.' "'I have thought of that,' Seb, said Abner. "'But do you not believe that the most Christian act that you and I could do would be to take him out and place him in a proper grave nearby?' "'Oh, no!' exclaimed Mary. "'Do not say such a thing as that. Think of his ghost. They killed him and put him there, that his ghost might guard their treasure. You know, Abner, as well as I do, that this is their dreadful fashion.' "'I know all about that,' said Abner, "'and that is the reason I wish to go to-night. I do not believe there has yet been time enough for his ghost to form. But let us take him out now, dear Mary, and lay him reverently away, and then—' He looked at her with flashing eyes. "'But, Abner,' said she, "'do you think we have the right?' "'Of course we have,' said he. "'Those treasures do not belong to the pirates. "'If we take them, they are treasure-trove, and legally ours. "'And think, dear Mary, how poor we are to-night, "'and how rich we may be to-morrow. "'Come, get the pail. We must be off.' "'Running nearly all the way, for they were in such a hurry they could not walk, "'Abner and Mary soon reached the bluff, "'and hastily scrambling down to the beach below, "'they stood upon the dreadful spot where Captain Kidd and his pirates "'had stood the night before. "'There was the old battered pine-tree reaching out two of its bare arms encouragingly toward them. 
Without loss of time, Abner walked up to the tree, put his back to it, and then looked up, up into the sky. Now he called Mary to him. "'Which star do you think he looked at, good wife?' said he. "'There is a bright one low down, and then there is another one a little higher up, and farther to the right, but it is fainter.' "'It would be the bright one, I think,' said Mary. And then Abner, his eyes fixed upon the bright star, commenced to stride. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Turning squarely around to the left, he again made seven paces, and now he beckoned vigorously to Mary to come and dig. For about ten minutes they dug, and then they laid bare a great mass of rocks. "'This isn't the place,' cried Abner. "'I must begin again. I did not look at that right star. I will take the other one.' For the greater part of that night Abner and Mary remained upon the beach. Abner would put his back against the tree, fix his eyes upon another star, stride forward seven paces, and then seven to the left, and he would come upon a little scrubby pine tree. Of course that was not the place.' The moon soon began to set, and more stars came out, so that Abner had a greater choice. Again and again he made his measurements, and every time that he came to the end of his second seven paces he found that it would have been impossible for the pirates to make their excavation there. There was clearly something wrong. Abner thought that he had not selected the right star, and Mary thought that his legs were not long enough. "'That pirate captain,' quoth she, "'had a long and manly stride. Seven of his paces would go as a far greater distance than seven of yours, Abner. Abner made his paces a little longer, but although he and his wife kept up their work until they could see the early dawn, they found no spot where it would be worth while to dig, and so mournfully they returned to their home in their empty cellar. As long as the moonlight lasted, Abner and Mary went to the little beach at the head of the bay, and made their measurements and their searches, but although they sometimes dug a little here and there, they always found that they had not struck the place where the pirate's treasure had been buried. When at last they gave up their search, and concluded to put their household goods back into their cellar, they told the tale to some of the neighbors, and other people went out and dug, not only at the place which had been designated, but miles up and down the coast, and then the story was told and retold, and so it has lasted until the present day. What has been said about the legendary Captain Kidd will give a very good idea of the estimation in which this romantic being has been, and still is, held in various parts of the country, and of all the legitimate legends about him, there is not one which recounts his piratical deeds upon our coast. The reason for this will be seen when we consider, in the next chapter, the life and character of the real Captain Kidd. End of chapter 31 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire Gauget. Buccaneers and the Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton. Chapter 32 The Real Captain Kidd. William Kidd, or Robert Kidd, as he is sometimes called, was a sailor in the merchant service who had a wife and family in New York. He was a very respectable man, and had a good reputation as a seaman, and about 1690, when there was war between England and France, Kidd was given the command of a privateer, and having had two or three engagements with French vessels, he showed himself to be a brave fighter and a prudent commander. Some years later he sailed to England, and, while there, he received an appointment of a peculiar character. It was at the time when the King of England was doing his best to put down the pirates of the American coast, and Sir George Bellamont, the recently appointed Governor of New York, recommended Captain Kidd as a very suitable man to command a ship to be sent out to suppress piracy. When Kidd agreed to take the position of Chief of Marine Police, he was not employed by the Crown, but by a small company of gentlemen of capital, who formed themselves into a sort of trust company, or society for the prevention of cruelty to merchantmen, and the object of their association was not only to put down pirates, but to put some money in their own pockets as well. Kidd was furnished with two commissions, one appointing him a privateer with authority to capture French vessels, and the other empowering him to seize and destroy all pirate ships. Kidd was ordered in his mission to keep a strict account of all booty captured, in order that it might be fairly divided among those who were stockholders in the enterprise, one-tenth of the total proceeds being reserved for the king. 
Kidd sailed from England in the Adventure, a large ship with thirty guns and eighty men, and on his way to America he captured a French ship which he carried to New York. Here he arranged to make his crew a great deal larger than had been thought necessary in England, and, by offering a fair share of the property he might confiscate on piratical or French ships, he induced a great many able seamen to enter his service, and when the Adventure left New York she carried a crew of one hundred and fifty men. With a fine ship and a strong crew, Kidd now sailed out of the harbor with the ostensible purpose of putting down piracy in American waters, but the methods of this legally appointed marine policeman were very peculiar, and instead of cruising up and down our coast, he gaily sailed away to the island of Madeira, and then around the Cape of Good Hope to Madagascar and the Red Sea, thus getting himself as far out of his regular beat as any New York constable would have been had he undertaken to patrol the dominions of the Con Tartary. By the time Captain Kidd reached that part of the world, he had been at sea for nearly a year without putting down any pirates or capturing any French ships. In fact, he had made no money whatsoever for himself or the stockholders of the company which had sent him out. His men, of course, must have been very much surprised at this unusual neglect of his own and his employer's interests, but when he reached the Red Sea he boldly informed them that he had made a change in his business, and he had decided that he would be no longer a suppressor of piracy, but would become a pirate himself, and instead of taking prizes of French ships only, which he was legally empowered to do, he would try to capture any valuable ship he could find on the seas, no matter to what nation it belonged. He then went on to state that his present purpose in coming into those oriental waters was to capture the rich fleet from Mocha, which was due in the lower part of the Red Sea about that time. The crew of the adventure, who must have been tired of having very little to do and making no money, expressed their entire approbation of their captain's change of purpose, and readily agreed to become pirates. Kidd waited a good while for the Mocha fleet, but it did not arrive, and then he made his first venture into actual piracy. He overhauled a Moorish vessel which was commanded by an English captain, and as England was not at war with Morocco, and as the nationality of the ship's commander should have protected him, Kidd thus boldly broke the marine laws which governed the civilized world, and stamped himself an out-and-out -out pirate. After the exercise of considerable cruelty, he extorted from his first prize a small amount of money, and although he and his men did not gain very much booty, they had whetted their appetites for more, and Kidd cruised savagely over the eastern seas in search of other spoils. After a time, the adventure fell in with a fine English ship called the Royal Captain, and although she was probably laden with rich cargo, Kidd did not attack her. His piratical character was not yet sufficiently formed to give him the disloyal audacity which would enable him with his English ship and his English crew to fall upon another English ship manned by another English crew. In time his heart might be hardened, but he felt that he could not begin with this sort of thing just yet. So the adventurers saluted the royal captain with ceremonious politeness, and each vessel passed quietly on its way. But this conscientious consideration did not suit Kidd's crew. They had already had a taste of booty, and they were hungry for more. And when the fine English vessel, of which they might so easily have made a prize, was allowed to escape them, they were loud in their complaints and grumblings. One of the men, a gunner named William Moore, became actually impertinent upon the subject, and he and Captain Kidd had a violent quarrel, in the course of which the captain picked up a heavy iron-bound bucket and struck the dissatisfied gunner on the head with it. The blow was such a powerful one that the man's skull was broken, and he died the next day. Captain Kidd's conscience seems to have been a good deal in his way, for although he had been sailing about in various eastern waters, taking prizes wherever he could, he was anxious that reports of his misdeeds should not get home before him. Having captured a fine vessel bound westward, he took from her all the booty he could, and then proceeded to arrange matters so that the captures of his ship should appear to be a legal transaction. The ship was manned by Moors and commanded by a Dutchman, and of course Kidd had no right to touch it, but the sharp-witted and business-like pirate selected one of the passengers and made him sign a paper declaring that he was a Frenchman and that he commanded the ship. When this statement had been sworn to before witnesses, Kidd put the document in his pocket so that if he were called upon to explain the transaction, he might be able to show that he had good reason to suppose that he had captured a French ship, which of course was all right and proper. Kidd now ravaged the East India waters, 
with great success and profit, and at last he fell in with a very fine ship from Armenia called the Kedag Merchant, commanded by an Englishman. Kidd's conscience had been growing harder and harder every day, and he did not now hesitate to attack any vessel. The great merchantman was captured, and proved to be one of the most valuable prizes ever taken by a pirate, for Kidd's own share of the spoils amounted to more than sixty thousand dollars. This was such a grand haul that Kidd lost no time in taking his prize to some place where he might safely dispose of her cargo and get rid of her passengers. Accordingly, he f sailed for Madagascar. It was there he fell in with the first pirate vessel he had met since he had started out to put down piracy. This was a ship commanded by an English pirate named Culliford, and there would have been a chance for Captain Kidd to show that, although he might transgress the law himself, he would be true to his engagement not to allow other people to do so. But he had given up upon putting down piracy, and instead of apprehending Culliford, he went into partnership with him, and the two agreed to go pirating together. This partnership, however, did not continue long, for Captain Kidd began to believe that it was time for him to return to his native country and make a report of his proceedings to his employers. Having confined his piratical proceedings to distant parts of the world, he hoped that he would be able to make Sir George Bellamont and the other stockholders suppose that his booty was all legitimately taken from French vessels cruising in the east, and when the proper division should be made he would be able to quietly enjoy his portion of the treasure he had gained. He did not go back in the adventure, which was probably lo not large enough to carry all the booty he had amassed, but putting everything on board his latest prize, the Kadag Merchant, he burned his old ship and sailed homeward. When he reached the West Indies, however, our wary sea robber was very much surprised to find that accounts of his evil deeds had reached America, and that the colonial authorities had been so much incensed by the news that the man who had been sent out to suppress piracy had become himself a pirate that they had circulated notices throughout the different colonies urging the arrest of Kidd if he should come into any American port. This was disheartening intelligence for the treasure-laden Captain Kidd, but he did not despair. He knew that the love of money was often as strong in the minds of human beings as the love of justice. Sir George Bellamont, who was now in New York, was one of the principal stockholders in the enterprise, and Kidd hoped that the rich share of the results of his industry, which would come to the governor, might cause unpleasant reports to be disregarded. In this case, he might yet return to his wife and family with a neat little fortune, and without danger of being called upon to explain his exceptional performances in the eastern seas. Of course Kidd was not so foolish and rash as to sail into New York harbor on board the Kedog Merchant, so he bought a small sloop and put the most valuable portion of his goods on board her, leaving his larger vessel, which also contained a great quantity of merchandise, in charge of one of his confederates, and in the little sloop he cautiously approached the coast of New Jersey. His great desire was to find out what sort of reception he might expect, so he entered Delaware Bay, and when he stopped at a little seaport in order to take in some supplies, he discovered that there was but a small chance of his visiting his home and his family, and of making a report to his superior in the character of a deserving mariner who had returned after a successful voyage. Some people in the village recognized him, and the report soon spread to New York that the pirate kid was lurking about the coast. A sloop of war was sent out to capture his vessel, and finding that it was impossible to remain in the vicinity where he had been discovered, Kidd sailed northward and entered Long Island Sound. Here the shrewd and anxious pirate began to act the part of the watchdog who has been killing sheep. In every way he endeavored to assume the appearance of innocence and to conceal every sign of misbehavior. He wrote to Sir George Bellamont that he should have called upon him in order to report his proceedings and hand over his profits, were it not for the wicked and malicious reports which had been circulated about him. It was during this period of suspense, when the returned pirate did not know what was likely to happen that it is supposed, by the believers in the hidden treasure of Kidd, that he buried his coin and bouillon and his jewels, some in one place and some in another, so that if he were captured his riches would not be taken with him. Among the wild stories which were believed at that time, and for long years after, was one to the effect that Captain Kidd's ship was chased up the Hudson River by a man of war, and that the pirates, finding they could not get away, sank their ship and fled to the shore with all the gold and silver they could carry, which they afterwards buried at the foot of Dunderberg Mountain. A great deal of rocky soil has been turned over at different times in search of these treasures, but no discoveries of hidden coin have yet been reported.
The fact is, however, that during this time of anxious waiting, Kidd never sailed west of Oyster Bay in Long Island. He was afraid to approach New York, although he had frequent communication with that city, and was joined by his wife and family. About this time occurred an incident which has given rise to all the stories regarding the buried treasure of Captain Kidd. The disturbed and anxious pirate concluded that it was a dangerous thing to keep so much valuable treasure on board his vessel which might at any time be overhauled by the authorities, and he therefore landed at Gardiner's Island on the Long Island coast, and obtained permission from the proprietor to bury some of his superfluous stores upon his estate. This was a straightforward transaction. Mr. Gardiner knew all about the burial of the treasure, and when it was afterward proved that Kidd was really a pirate, the hidden booty was all given up to the government. This appears to be the only case in which it was positively known that Kidd buried treasure on our coast, and it has given rise to all the stories of the kind which have ever been told. For some weeks Kidd's sloop remained in Long Island Sound, and then he took courage and went to Boston to see some influential people there. He was allowed to go freely about the city for a week, and then he was arrested. The rest of Kidd's story is soon told. He was sent to England for trial, and there he was condemned to death, not only for the piracies he had committed, but also for the murder of William Moore. He was executed, and his body was hung in chains on the banks of the Thames, where for years it dangled in the wind, a warning to all evil-minded sailors. About the time of Kidd's trial and execution, a ballad was written which has a wide circulation in England and America. It was set to music, and for many years helped to spread the fame of this pirate. The ballad was a very long one, containing nearly twenty-six verses, and some of them run as follows. My name was Robert Kidd when I sailed, when I sailed. My name was Robert Kidd when I sailed. My name was Robert Kidd. God's laws I did forbid, and so wickedly I did when I sailed. My parents taught me well when I sailed, when I sailed. My parents taught me well when I sailed. My parents taught me well to shun the gates of hell, but against them I rebelled when I sailed. I'd a Bible in my hand when I sailed, when I sailed. I'd a Bible in my hand when I sailed. I'd a Bible in my hand, but my father's great command, and sunk it in the sand when I sailed. I murdered William Moore as I sailed, as I sailed. I murdered William Moore as I sailed. I murdered William Moore and laid him in his gore, not many leagues from shore, as I sailed. I was sick and nigh to death when I sailed, when I sailed. I was sick and nigh to death when I sailed. I was sick and nigh to death, and I vowed at every breath to walk in wisdom's ways as I sailed. I thought I was undone as I sailed, as I sailed. I thought I was undone as I sailed. I thought I was undone, and my wicked glass had run, but health did soon return as I sailed. My repentance lasted not as I sailed, as I sailed. My repentance lasted not as I sailed. My repentance lasted not. My vows I soon forgot. Damnation was my lot as I sailed. I spied the ships from France as I sailed, as I sailed. I spied the ships from France as I sailed. I spied the ships from France. To them I did advance, and took them all by chance as I sailed. I spied the ships of Spain as I sailed, as I sailed. I spied the ships of Spain as I sailed. I spied the ships of Spain. I fired on them a main, till most of them was slain as I sailed. I had ninety bars of gold as I sailed, as I sailed. I had ninety bars of gold as I sailed. I had ninety bars of gold and dollars manifold, with riches uncontrolled as I sailed. Thus being overtaken at last, I must die, I must die. Thus being overtaken at last, I must die. Thus being overtaken at last, and into prison cast, and sentence being passed, I must die. Farewell the raging main, I must die, I must die. Farewell the raging main, I must die. Farewell the raging main, to Turkey, France, and Spain. I shall ne'er see you again, I must die. To execution dock, I must go, I must go. To execution dock, I must go. To execution dock, will many thousands flock, but I must bear the shock, and must die. Come all ye young and old, see me die, see me die. Come all ye young and old, see me die. Come all ye young and old, you're welcome to my gold, for by it I've lost my soul and must die. Take warning now by me, for I must die, for I must die. Take warning now by me, for I must die. Take warning now by me, and shun bad company, lest you come to hell with me, for I die. It is said that Kidd showed no repentance when he was tried, but insisted that he was the victim of malicious persons who swore falsely against him. And yet a more thoroughly dishonest rascal never sailed under the black flag. 
in the guise of an accredited officer of the government he committed the crimes he was sent out to suppress he deceived his men he robbed and misused his fellow countrymen and his friends and he even descended to the meanness of cheating and despoiling the natives of the west india islands with whom he traded these people were in the habit of supplying pirates with food and other necessaries, and they always found their rough customers entirely honest, and willing to pay for what they received. For as the pirates made a practice of stopping at certain points for supplies, they wished of course to be on good terms with those who furnished them. But Kidd had no ideas of honor towards people of high or low degree. He would trade with the natives as if he intended to treat them fairly, and pay for all he got. But when the time came for him to depart, and he was ready to weigh anchor, he would seize upon all the commodities he could lay his hands upon, and without paying a copper to the distressed and indigent Indians, he would gaily sail away, his black flag flaunting derisively in the wind. But although in reality Captain Kidd was no hero, he has been known for a century and more as the great American pirate, and his name has been representative of piracy ever since. Years after he had been hung, when people heard that a vessel with a black flag, or one which looked black in the distance, flying from its rigging, had been seen, they forgot that the famous pirate was dead, and imagined that Captain Kidd was visiting their part of the coast in order that he might find a good place to bury some treasure, which it was no longer safe for him to carry about. There were two great reasons for the fame of Captain Kidd. One of these was the fact that he had been sent out by important officers of the crown who expected to share the profits of his legitimate operations, but who were supposed by their enemies to be perfectly willing to take any sort of profits provided it could not be proved that they were the results of piracy, and who afterwards allowed Kidd to suffer for their sins as well as his own. These opinions introduced certain political features into his career, and made him a very much talked-of man. The greater reason for his fame, however, was the widespread belief in his buried treasures, and this made him the object of the most intense interest to hundreds of misguided people who hoped to be lucky enough to share his spoils. There were other pirates on the American coast during the eighteenth century, and some of them became very well known, but their stories are not uncommon, and we need not tell them here. As our country became better settled, and as well-armed revenue-cutters began to cruise up and down our Atlantic coast for the protection of our commerce, pirates became fewer and fewer, and even those who were still bold enough to ply their trade grew milder in their manners, less daring in their exploits, and, more important than anything else, so unsuccessful in their illegal enterprises that they were forced to admit that it was now more profitable to command or work a merchantman than endeavor to capture one, and so the sea robbers of our coast gradually passed away. End of chapter 32 Buccaneers and the Pirates of Our Coast by Frank Richard Stockton